Steve Borey of the Comic Book Bears podcast here, and I wanted to say a couple words about Stan Lee in light of his recent passing. Now, Stan may have gotten his start writing romance comics and war stories for Marvel Comics and Timely back in the day, but it was the characters that he co-created with Jack Kirby and others in the early 60s that really cemented his legacy. I mean, these are characters like Fantastic Four and Spider-Man and my personal favorite, the X-Men, that today are recognized the world over. And not just the stories that he wrote or plotted, usually with titles that could rival a New York Post or a Variety headline for alliteration and ridiculousness, but sometimes it was what he wrote in the editorial pages, in the back matter and letter columns with his Stan soapbox, that really, I think, make him a little bit more important than just a comics writer or creator. He took that time to hype comics as a viable piece of literature and culture, that what's written on the page here with sequential art, whether it's superheroes or more serious fare, are important, not just for kids, but people of all ages and all backgrounds and all walks of life, that the stories themselves can tickle the imagination, but also inspire and make people want to be better. And beyond that, of course, he's been a ceaseless champion and cheerleader for comics as a whole during his entire career. In fact, I'm sure he'd probably, if he were here today, like to take some credit for keeping the entire industry afloat over the past 50 years through ups and downs and bankruptcies and collapses in the market. But really, I think the fact that this man has been everywhere and done everything, quote-unquote, comics is one of the reasons that you'll be remembered for decades to come as one of the most important figures in the history of this medium. So thank you so much, Stan, for all of the inspiration, the silliness, the goofy cameos, and of course, thank you for your comics. L'chaim, and good luck on your next journey. Thank you so much, Stan Lee. Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of the Southern Fried Geekery Podcast. And today is going to be hard. As you heard from the opener, uh, we're going to be talking about the passing of Stan Lee today. Uh, it, it's kind of a in-memoriam thing that we're all, I think, unhappy to do. But at the same time, we, we all immediately jumped in and wanted to do it. Um, as usual, I'm Caleb Alexander McKenzie. I'm Sean. And I'm Jerry. And Craig's job is trying to kill him. Uh, we're, so that's why he is not going to be with us. I think for the next two weeks is, uh, un- unfortunately because, um, a little behind the scenes, we're doubling up on episodes today and he couldn't be here. So you're stuck with the three of us for a little bit. And I hope that's not too bad. Uh, if it is, would, you know, I deeply apologize, but come back later and, and get more Craig. Craig, <laughs> Sean Craig, is getting assaulted by a kitty. <laughs> Craig, Craig's cat Domini is here in his place. Um, <laughs> crawling on the table just as for, Craig would do. Yes. As Craig's doing. rubbing, rubbing his, rubbing his nose all over Sean's, showing mic. us his butt. <laughs> um, as Craig is wont to do, as yeah. Craig is wont to do. <laughs> so I think to kick this off, um, let's handle the business side of things first, uh, and and get the the stuff done throughout the week that that you are owed as fans and listeners of the show, and then we'll move on to some of the amazing stuff that we uh, that Stanley has done. Some things we want to say about those those things. Um, And interdispersed in the episode, you're going to hear clips of people who are friends of ours, people who are friends of the show, maybe even yourselves, if you're one of the people who has sent them in, of of things that that you guys have had to say about Stan Lee, because he doesn't just affect our lives, he he affects all of our lives, um, both on the show and off the show. And so I think that's really cool. And so I want to say thank you to everybody who... Who did that? If you're somebody who wanted to but didn't to, um, you know, maybe we can do something at a later time uh, where you get to do that. Because uh, you know, part of doing this show is we want to. It's not only our voices, man. We're, we're trying to build a community. We're trying to to reach out and do all sorts of things. So, all right, let's let's move on with this. Sean, you sure. draw drawings right. every week. I draw the drawings. You yes. do the draws. You are correct. <laughs> drawers <laughs> yes uh i've been getting requests from you great listeners and fans on our social medias and i do a drawn a day as part of my uh new year's resolution to draw every day to get back into it 
It's been great. And I've appreciated every single request. And we had some very good ones this week. As always, they come up with very creative and very different drawings. As you're about to hear, started off with a character I've never thought to draw or ever would have drawn in my life. I'm not a fan. But Dalton Shannon wanted me to draw Hawkman. The most wholesome human we know. <laughs> he really, I mean, Dalton, not Hawkman. Oh, I was about to say. <laughs> I was like, I don't know. Is he? Is, he's a, a bird. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I actually, actually talked to him at the convention. And he Hawkman is or Dalton? Fucking yes. both. He is loving the Hawkman series. Yeah. Oh, it's good. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and and he really appreciated the drawing, and I'm happy to hear that. Uh, I'm going blank because it's early in the morning, but I wasn't drinking last night. What's Dalton's uh, four color comics? Yes. Four, yes, four yeah, color four, comics. Four color media. Four color media. Yeah. Check out his stuff online. He's uh, producing his own comic book, so a little shout out to him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He's on what? Twitter and Facebook, right? I believe so. Yeah. Uh, him and, and I think they have a uh, Instagram too. I think so. Yeah. Him and Watt is yeah, his Watt. partner's name. Yep. Indeed. After that. I was requested to draw us, the Southern Fry Geekery crew, Woo! as the Sailor Scouts from Sailor Moon. Yay. Uh, that was from Nick Perry, who just wanted to make us all uncomfortable. I was. And I'm, amazed. Okay, I, me uncomfortable. I think Stephanie was the most comfortable person with she, this request. She <laughs> loved Jerry as Sailor Moon. <laughs> and I think in my drawing, Jerry loved being Sailor Moon. And I feel like he'd embrace it harder than any one of oh, us. Oh, I would. I'd rock the shit out of that, <laughs> that skirt. Craig was not down for the cosplay. <laughs> I had to have somebody be like, nope. <laughs> My tattoos disappeared. They did because, uh, as Jerry explained, online, Sailor Transformation. Yeah. Whenever you transform, you know. And, and, and totally not because I got lazy drawing the entire <laughs> Sailor Scouts and wanted to move the fuck on. <laughs> no way. No way. <laughs> After that, it was Dark Wing Duck, as requested by Mike Del Vecchio. Mm-hmm. Uh, very fun to draw. I used to draw like ducktails and stuff like that back in the day, and I haven't drawn them in decades. Oh, I love Darkwing. So it was kind of cool to draw ducks again. Weirdly enough, as that may sound. <laughs> uh, after that, Jerry Smith of Southern Fried Geekery requested a flying pig. So of course, I had to do Hamlet, our flying pig. Yes, from the uh, fan fiction that never was <laughs> about the flying pig. Pirates. Listen, it's just uh, in hiatus. Okay, it's in hiatus. indefinite hiatus. We'll get back on it. <laughs> One of these days. Never. <laughs> After that, uh, I was requested to, to draw a nice picture of Jerry with Stephanie, his boo thing. Everybody just wants to see me get hurt. Because he gets enough hate drawing. She wanted a nice <laughs> drawing. So I did my damnedest to make Jerry look nice and attractive. <laughs> Jerry. <laughs> I mean, that's not hard to do. Jerry is generally nice and attractive. Hi. Opinion. <laughs> 50 50 rule. I'll say something bad about him. <laughs> <laughs> but it was it was nice to draw. Not, Jerry not getting suplexed or beat up or <laughs> anything else. What, what you don't know is in that picture, she had two in a stink. It, 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 it hurt <laughs> him a little bit. You're not wrong. So it's behind the scenes. There's just a knife behind my back. <laughs> Better smile. <laughs> Never leave me. <laughs> but yeah, but yes, that was requested from one, Stephanie Straw. After that, I got to draw, which I really like these. Uh, when you have, like, it's easy to draw a like, drawing that, like, you know, Captain America, Hawkman, you know, the pre existing characters. But I got a very detailed explanation about a Dungeons and Dragons character from Joshua Ford for his warlock. He said he's never had a definitive appearance, and he allowed me to create that. And I thought that was very cool, very fun to draw. Mm-hmm. Based off, like, he gave me full details of how he's supposed to look and be, and had fun with that one. So it really reminded me, because I was looking at this and I was trying to figure out why it looked familiar. And I was going through my brain. The way, the way, I mean, the way you drew it and the way I think he described it, it looks a lot like the guy from Game of Thrones, the, uh, who is the assassin that has like the, the white streak, the man oh, who oh, has the yeah. name. The man, man yeah. Man, he's the name. Yeah, the, the many face oh. gods uh, oh, assassin. Yeah. And so it kind of looks like that dude. So good job. Well, yeah, that's actually the character in the uh, game that Stephanie is DMing. Oh, is it, is mm-hmm. it a newer character? Yeah. Well, okay. I wasn't sure. Yeah. I, I don't know why. I just kind of assumed. Yeah, we've, we've yeah. had three sessions so far. I think we're going to try to shoot for one this next Friday. Well, props to uh, Josh for having a definitive vision of his character this early. I mean, like, legitimately, yeah. like, you know, you, go, you, you say, for those who played. D and D and Pathfinder and all that, you might know what I'm talking about. Is like I'm creating a barbarian that swings a giant axe. But it takes sessions upon sessions to really formulate a character and like their appearance, let alone just like the personality. Josh gave me a detail that he knew yeah. exactly what the fuck he was making. It was yeah. cool. It was very cool. I enjoyed drawing that. He has a good imagination. Indeed. And wrapping up the week, it was again drawing ducks. Count Duckula, if anybody remembers that from their childhood. Uh BBC cartoon about a uh 
duck, a lineage of vampire ducks that they were resurrecting him, but they used tomato juice instead of blood. So yeah. now he's a vegetarian vampire. That was requested by one Rod Hedrick. And that is today's requests. That's awesome, dude. I've got a little bit left in this month and one more month to go before I've completed my New Year's resolution with the, with, with the help of our listeners. I greatly appreciate it. I am going to continue this after the year's end because I want to keep drawing. Although I'm maybe not the daily schedule, maybe not daily, but I want to keep, I want to keep practicing. The biggest issue is markers are expensive, y'all, and especially quality art markers. So like, I want y'all to keep requesting stuff. Please. Keep he it also wants you to send him marker money. I'm not going to hate if that happens. Uh, if you want to come by our booths and say hi and throw markers at me, I'm greatly appreciate it, but I may just stick to more going back to black and white with the occasional color. Just, just for cost. That's all. I love doing these drawings, and I appreciate it greatly. Thank y'all very much. That's rad, and we love seeing them, man. It's it's a lot of fun. It's been a great uh, great thing to have on the show. So, all right, are we ready to get to the hard part of the show? Yes and no. Yeah. So, unless you live under a rock um, on a different planet in a different multiverse that's been squished by Doctor Manhattan, then you know who Stanley was, and by this time, you know that he's passed away. Uh, it's been about a week now in real life and you know, who knows if you don't listen to the show on a weekly basis, uh, whenever you get this. Um, but you know, it happened. Uh, he was 95. We kind of all expected it to happen sooner or later. I think we were all hoping for later. Um, but I think it still hit us like a ton of bricks. At least it did me. Uh, I have been a piece of shit all week (laughs) because of it. Um, and so to move into it, um, I thought that it might behoove us to just read his obituary. And so I pulled up the BBC News Entertainment and Arts obituary uh, entitled The Genius of the Superhero Creator, Stanley. Many marvel at the man who gave his characters extraordinary powers and everyday headaches, a formula which revolutionized comics. The Hulk, Iron Man, Daredevil, and the Fantastic Four all sprang from his fertile imagination and spilled onto the page. While his career may have started in pen and ink, it grew and evolved to much more. From digital graphic novels to blockbuster Hollywood films, leading Marvel Comics, from a small division of a publishing house to a large multimedia corporation, Stan Lee was prolific. Born in 1922 to poor working-class Jewish immigrants from Romania, Stan Lee Martin Lieber got a job at Timely Productions that would eventually become Marvel Comics, a company owned by a relative. I think it was his uncle or his cousin-in-law, um... I'm not sure which. He was assigned to the comics division and thanks to the reach of his imagination, rose to editor by the age of 18. For more than 20 years, he was the ultimate hack, knocking out crime stories, horrors, westerns, anything to sell the appetite of his juvenile readership. Words of more than two syllables were discouraged. Characters were either all good or all bad with no shades of gray. So embarrassed was Lieber by much of what he was creating that he refused to put his name on the byline. He assumed a quote-unquote dumb name, Stan Lee, which he later legally adopted. By the time he was 40, he decided he was too old for the comics game. His British-born wife, Joan, suggested that he had nothing to lose for his uh, when he was about to quit uh, what was Marvel Comics, and for his swan song should just write the kind of characters that he really wanted to create. After a rival comic had came up with a super team consisting of Batman, Superman, and Wonder Woman, Timely needed to respond. Lee's answer in 1961 was the first Fantastic Four, a team of astronauts who gained superpowers after being bombarded with cosmic rays. They were to change Stan Lee's life in the comics industry forever. Lee gave each character individual everyday teenage problems such as dandruff and acne. They would frequently fall out with their parents and with each other. The fan letters poured in. Without immediately knowing it, Stan Lee had ushered in the so-called Silver Age of Comics, and his imagination was rekindled. His Marvel Universe spawned the new title of the Marvel Comics. Soon after, nerdy Peter Parker was transformed after a bite from irradiated spiders into something who could crawl up walls in the sides (laughs) of New York skyscrapers. Spider-Man was born. He was to become the icon of the modern, modern popular culture. Spidey, as he is affectionately known, had quite extraordinary powers, yet he had problems at work and at home and with his girlfriends. At last, the teenager was no longer just the sidekick, but the main hero, and the hero he was no longer just brawn he had brains too just because he's a hero and has superpowers doesn't means he doesn't mean he does not have problems stanley told bbc 
The Hulk, Mighty Thor, and Iron Man, and the rest all grappled with problems like drug abuse, bigotry, and social inequality. Radically, Lee gave his gave the artist responsible for the comics designs credit for their work. Jack Kirby, Frank Miller, John Romita, Steve Ditko, and others all received cult status in their own right. Other superheroes broke new ground in other ways. Daredevil was blind, Black Panther was black, Silver Surfer pondered the state of humanity. Lee's influence remains. Some years ago, the Marvel hero Northstar came out of the closet, and then he later got married. In its heyday, Marvel was selling 50 million copies a year. Until he retired from editing in 71, Stan wrote all the copy for Marvel covers. In 99, Stan, his uh, Stan Lee media venture, aimed at marrying comic strips with the internet, went spectacularly wrong. Lee went bankrupt and his business partner landed in prison for fraud. In 2001, he started a new company entitled PAL, Purveyors of Wonder Entertainment, which went on to develop films and TV programs. His half-century-year-old creations are still enduring as ever. With the X-Men, the Fantastic Four, the Hulk, the Daredevil, Iron Man, and the Avengers all given the Hollywood treatment. Spider-Man was huge at the box office, and more recently the Captain America films starring Chris Evans and later the Avengers have pulled in over $3 billion uh, gross. Well over that. And fans delighted in seeing uh, seeing, seeing Stan's brief cameo appearances. In later years, he lamented his deteriorating eyesight, which would mean he could no longer read the comic books that he that made his name and he passed away this week. And that's kind of the end of, of that BBC article. Um, well said. Yes. It really was. It, it, it's hard to read. So that's, that's, that's kind of where we are. So to, to get us through this episode, because we wanted to give Stanley a tribute and, and we're going to talk about kind of the entirety of what Stanley was. We're not going to gloss over some of the more problematic things that, that happened with him. But we're also not going to disrespect the man. Uh, and, and, you know, some of us have opinions that maybe aren't going to be liked by others um, who have a more idealized view of Stan or who just want to think of Stan as kind of a mustache twirling villain because he was neither of those things. Uh, and so we're going to talk about that. But first, we got on our Facebook page and we put up a post and said, hey, if you have questions about Stan, if you have uh, Stanley inspired things you want said, or if you, you want discussions on the show, um, drop them here. And you guys did. You, you responded amazingly. And it's going to take up the bulk of the show because this is not a thing that we wanted to spread out over multiple, uh, episodes. We want to kind of just spend this next little bit of time celebrating this life. And so, we're going to get into some of these questions right now. And we hope you enjoy it. And, and thank you for coming along for the ride. So the first one comes from Robert Skinner, and he wants to know each of our favorite and least favorite Stan Lee cameos. How do we want to start this off, guys? Uh, do you want to? Uh, I, I'll start. Yeah, sure, Jerry. Go ahead, buddy. Um, I did not pick a least favorite. I'll go ahead and say that uh, because I kind of feel like even like the worst movies were kind of made better by his cameos. Right. For instance, my favorite one was uh, actually from Daredevil. Very cool. Yeah. Um, it's a scene where, uh, you know, Matt, had, it was still a kid, so he was still trying to, you know, learn how to use all of his powers and stuff after being splashed by the radiation and stuff. He's like, they're standing on the edge of a street and Stanley's got a newspaper in his face mm-hmm. and he's about to walk out into the street mm-hmm. and like Matt stops him from getting hit by a bus or whatever. And then he keeps walking and then Stanley puts the newspaper down. And he's like, oh, what just happened? <laughs> oh, that blind kid saved me kind of thing. And, uh. Yeah, I don't know. I've I've always because that was like probably one of my first real times like recognizing him really well in a movie. Right. You know, like people will bash that movie all day, but uh, I don't know. It's got a lot of nostalgia with me. Okay, and, that's yeah. fair for yeah. sure. Yeah. Uh, I'm kind of taking Jerry's approach to the least favorite thing. I'm just gonna mention my least favorite movie that had an amazing Stanley cameo in it. For at least one is Amazing Spider Man. Horrible, horrible fucking movie, but but Stanley as a librarian with the headset on, not hearing oh, the yeah. battle go on behind yeah. him, was the highlight of that mm-hmm. entire horrible fucking movie. <laughs> <laughs> My favorite one is not in a comic book movie, although it's heavily inspired by a comics movie. Is actually Mallrats. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yep. I it's actually the first time he ever came at least to me. At least that's the first movie I knew that Stanley in a movie mm-hmm. being himself. Granted, but we think he's also himself in the <laughs> Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. But if you haven't seen Mallrats, uh. He was doing an appearance at a comic book shop in the mall, and uh, the main character wanted to get his buddy out of his rut with his uh, love interest. So he had Stan Lee talk to him because he's a big comic book fan. 
So Stanley gives him a long story about love and loss and all the stuff that happened. He said he always regretted it and all the stuff. And he inspired him to go and get back his girl. And then he's like, well, man, what'd you tell him? He goes, oh, I just gave him some old vulture soliloquy from a Spider-Man comic. <laughs> 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 love, be a vulture tonight, I think is what he quoted. It was like, it's just, it was, it was my favorite Stanley cameo. Uh, what's that quote? You know, when he asked him, would you give it all up? And he says, every, every yeah. day. Every day. Um, to get and, and you know if you watch that like now one minute of all the all the comics oh yeah all the comics yeah, all the comics <laughs> all the comics which was also interrupted by him asking him questions like you know yeah. does everything stretch on Mr. Fantastic yeah everyone's everything everyone's right? genitals he yeah. had a lot of very genitalia because you can check with your friend he's really obsessed with superhero <laughs> genitals you guys know that, that that those are questions that get asked oh absolutely yeah. like, that, that got asked to him all the time by it's Kevin re- Smith <laughs> right yeah no, no joke no doubt. Um, yeah, if you watch that now, I, I actually did watch it this week. Just oh, that wow. scene just yeah. tears you up inside, man. Uh, yeah. But it also makes you giggle. So, <laughs> um, I, I, I think we're all on the same page with the, the worst cameo or the least favorite cameo. I don't have one. As you guys have already well stated, there is no time that Stanley walked into a film that was bad, at least in that moment. So, but my favorite, it's kind of the first one in the, 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 the big blockbuster franchises. And that's the X-Men film, uh, the first one. Stan Lee plays a hot dog vendor uh, mm-hmm. when Senator Kelly like comes walking out of the water when he's been like transformed and mutated by Magneto's giant weird thing. Yeah, um, yeah. And, you know, he's all like gloopy and he's been swimming like a little amoeba in the <laughs> sea uh, when he walks out on the beach and he's just naked. And everybody's <laughs> just like looking weirdly. Uh, Stan Lee is the hot dog vendor and he's just right. got like, stuff kind of just falls off his hot dog. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and yeah, I still giggle. I still crack up when I watch that. And I still watch that movie. I think it's a good movie. I think one of the more popular ones and another one that, that should really be mentioned is, uh, was it Spider-Man two where he got the key to the city or is it Spider-Man three? Oh Lord. I can't. Well, um, that. anyway, he was, he was going to get the key of the city and he was walking through, I guess it was Times Square and they had the big thing saying mayor to give Spider-Man key of the city. Right. And Stan Lee oh. walks up and he's like, you know, I guess one guy can make all the difference. Yep. Oh, and man. yeah, okay. it was, it was a really good one. one. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm, I, I want to say it was the, uh, it was the third one. Cause I think Sandman interrupted it. That would make sense. Yeah. That makes sense why I wouldn't remember it. I've seen that movie once. Yeah. <laughs> Was it in Guardians of the Galaxy when he was with the Watchers? Uh, two. Part Gar- two. Yeah, yeah. Geo- yeah. So 10. that was, that was my favorite. I really uh, Honestly, you know, I love the, the one from the X-Men movie, but I think that one might act like I might have to just. Where he's going in. through all of his different incarnations. Right. Yeah. Because that, mm-hmm. like, it makes it meta. It yeah. makes him an actual character. And it, it, even, even in like the Fox films and the, the Sony films and the mm-hmm. Marvel films, it connects them all in at least a minuscule kind of way. Right. Uh, so yeah, no, actually, I think I, just, Robert, I'm, I'm, I'm reversing course, buddy. This is <laughs> in, in probably my least favorite Marvel. Well, one of my least favorite Marvel movies. Mm-hmm. It get my, it gets my best. Which cameo. still isn't really saying, you know, a whole. Oh no, whole it's not. Lot. That's yes, right. it's yeah. my least favorite Marvel movie. Still leaps and bounds uh, better than some distinguished competition films. <laughs> and, a, um, and, no, and a little special shout out to, uh, I'm sure what was fun for him to uh, film was him being the DJ in the strip club in Deadpool. Oh yeah. <laughs> yep. What about you, Craig? Oh, no, you're still not here. No. Nope. <laughs> I love you, Craig. <laughs> we got him on the show. I hope that picked up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it did. It's great. Awesome. Hey, what's up guys? My name's Nick Wiley. I just got into comics about two years ago. I'm 29 years old right now. Kind of miss the era of the Stan Lee comics. I'm definitely going to go back and check them out whenever I start collecting old copies. But uh, how I remember Stan Lee was the first time I seen him was in Spider-Man, the uh, one and two and three, the original Spider-Man movies. They were awesome. Nowadays, what makes Stan Lee great to me is I have an 11-year-old son, and we go to these uh, Marvel movies Every time they come out, every one of them, on opening night, hopefully, if, you know, something crazy don't happen. Me and him have a little contest who can point him out first whenever he jumps in the movies. I wish I remembered him whenever he done the comics. But when I was growing up, I loved the cartoons, but I never really got into comics because I lived in an area where there wasn't no comic book store or, like, there was no way I could, you know, find comics because I lived in a small town. But uh, Stan Lee was uh, obviously a big part of my life, and I'm glad I can see that now and have something to show with my kid that you know maybe we can both get into when he gets a little older maybe we can both get into the comics and that'd be awesome but uh 
yeah, the, the only really way I remember Stan Lee right now is from uh, from the cameos in the movies. But it's real, it's a real nice, memorable moment when you see him to, uh, you know, for me and my son to get to point him out. He's a big influence just from the movies because the movies are so popular. Like I said, I want to get back and, you know, listen, read some of his older content stuff, what he created, you know. But it is a sad day when he passed away yesterday. Hopefully everybody can, you know, cherish the moments they had with him and, Move, move on from there and keep enjoying his stuff. Hopefully his stuff will be timeless and everybody will enjoy it for years and years upon years. So. Excelsior! So Nick Perry wants, hey Nick. wants to... Mm-hmm. Yeah, hey Nick. Do I know Nick? Uh, I don't think you've ever met him. Have I not? I actually, I don't think either one of you. I, I met him... He was actually my DM in uh, Starfinder game that I was playing. Oh, I um, feel like I know him. But met I him at adult know. game night. Uh, he's, he's very active on Facebook. Maybe that's yes. how I know yeah, him. Yeah. Absolutely. Hey, Nick. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> Random tangents. Um, <laughs> he wants to know what kind of impact, if any, do you think Stan and his work will have on future generations? Uh, so I'll kick this one off. Number one, we're going to scratch out that if any part because there is zero chance that he does not have an impact on the future generations. And that is for many of the, the things that we've already spoken about, like the billion dollar blockbuster hits uh, featuring characters that he ha- at least helped create, if didn't create them all himself. You, you've got cult films, things like uh, mall rats that he's been in. He voiced Spider-Man, uh, you know, so he's, he's definitely, he has an impact if for nothing but a tangential impact and, and to people enjoying that work, um, for characters that we don't know. I mean, on some level, if you have a character that you love, then the creator of that character has an impact, even if you don't know the creator's name. Right. Uh, so they have an impact on your life, even if you don't know who they are. And so for the second part of that question, what kind of impact? Well, the man created a lifestyle like that, you know, again, our, our, our co-create, I'm, I'm going to use that word fluidly. So please don't be that person who comes and yells at me on the internet. You said he created and then Jack Kirby. It, it's a fluid word in this episode, guys. Uh, so don't, don't be that guy or that lady, depending on who don't you be are. that person. Yeah. <laughs> um, don't be that person. But he, Stanley cre- created a lifestyle. He, he didn't just create a thing. Like he didn't just make a book that we all love. Um, he didn't just create a character that we all... He created a lifestyle. So many of us who are comic book fans really do wrap our lives, so much of our lives, around the the themes and the characters and the books and the fandom and the love of this material that it has no choice but to kind of seep into our everyday lives. At least it does for mine. There is not a day that goes by that I don't walk into my office and see art featuring characters that Stan Lee creates. There's not a day that that goes by that I don't look at a shelf full of films or a bookshelf full of these creations uh, that I don't wear a T-shirt usually that has something that features a character that he created, that I don't read a comic that has something that he created, or that somebody like Netflix, or that you don't see people embodying the spirit of the things that he created. Some of our greatest scientists, Neil deGrasse Tyson, huge Marvel fan. Some of my favorite writers, uh, Walter Mosley, huge Marvel fan. And that all ties back into Stan Lee. So the impact is legion at this point. It's it's too large to really name. And if you want to get down into the brass tacks of maybe the lessons that we learned from him, it goes even farther because you don't have to mention Stan Lee or superheroes by name. But if if the X-Men was your first in introduction into fighting bigotry and you've dedi- and you've never picked up an X-Men comic in the last 40 years, but you work as a social worker because watching that cartoon in the 90s really gave you the, the, the drive to make the world a better place, that's his legacy. And that has an impact beyond his name, beyond his characters. So that to, to me, that's that's the answer, the, the best answer I can give to that question. And I, I hope I, I don't even know if I answered it, but I hope I did. <laughs> no, nah, I think you said it better than me or Jer, Danny or anybody else probably could have <laughs> uh, done that. Like, yeah, I mean, you nailed it on the head. Like, as much as he's contributed to the genre and the industry, you can't really nail down anything because he's been a part with, like you said, co-creating, writing. And like, I'm going to repeat this several times throughout this show. The biggest contribution, and to my knowledge, I mean, I could be wrong, I may not have been the first, but he definitely was the one that did it in mass. 
bring in humanity to superheroes. Absolutely. He took the godlike forms out of a superhero and made them street level and relatable yep. to the average man. And that alone showed that you didn't have to create an alien god to come and save everybody. It can be just Bill on the street who got a little acid on him and now he's saving people. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that's as far as a creative standpoint and showing that you can make that and make it work is definitely one of his biggest contributions to the industry. And, and I mean, honestly, that was, that was close to my answer too. Yeah. just, just having all the, uh, the humanity and characters. And, you know, there was a lot of stuff floating around, uh, Stan Lee this week, a lot of videos and stuff. You could not, you could not go onto social media without seeing at least five or six things, you know, that, that, uh, that was posted. And one of the things that I, uh, I actually watched was, uh, he was on Conan and they were getting, I think it was like 95, 96, and they were getting ready to release, Marvel versus DC. Wait, wait, back, back up. Uh huh. What did you say he was on? He was on. Oh, what what was it? The Tonight Show or no? You were Conan? right. You just uh, it, you, you said Conan <laughs> instead of Conan. Oh, uh, whatever. <laughs> uh, I think that's why he paused. So in my brain, I saw Stanley uh, get an interview by, by Arnold Schwarzenegger. Yeah, I mean that that would be amazing too. But no, he was just kind of like Conan. Conan O'Brien was yes, O'Brien. was uh, was talking about. Um, you know, how, you know, Superman and Batman could probably just destroy. And Stanley kind of got into a, not, not necessarily a tangent, but just kind of talking about how, you know, Superman has all these powers and he's constantly coming up with powers. He kind of brings up the fact that it kind of gets boring to write because yeah. he, you know, he's just like has everything and he's just super powerful. And he gets into his characters about how, you know, they're vulnerable and they're not super powerful and everything like that. And they're very human and they have family members. And he really expresses that in his comics. And I think like he has really been that, that milestone person that really started that off. And so many comics that we get today, you know, we'll, we'll touch on stuff like that. And mm-hmm. I really think a lot of that is, is thanks to him that, you know, we just don't have, you know, all these characters that can solve uh, a problem and an issue and stuff like that. And, you know, they still have like personal personal issues going on at home and things that they have to deal with and and everything like that, you know, that the everyday person has to deal with. Right. And and it's I mean, that was just like one of the biggest things I feel like Stanley brought to comics mm-hmm. um, in general. No, no, and for like, sure. And like, like I said, you bring up the job aspect, and that's something that just really kind of clicked with me. He had a job because he had to uh, for his secret identity. You never saw Superman also snapping pictures for his newspaper job while fighting Lex Luthor. Right. Spider-Man did that because he had to pay his bills. Mm-hmm. He was still in costume, and he knew pictures of himself would get him money. Like That was that was integrated in there. And right. If we were doing that and we knew we could benefit from that while kick, fighting some crime, I think any man would do that. And mm-hmm. I, like that's how humanity he brings. Yeah, and, and not about that. No, no. To it, take it even further, it's not just his bills; it's his aunt's bills. Right, so he's right. he's worried about his little old lady aunt getting evicted and being out on the street, and he's selling it to a man that he knows hates him. Absolutely. Uh, and, and so there's so multi there's so many multi textual layers to those things that it just baffles me. We we take it for granted now, but he was the first one to do that. So we we kind of think it. Think of it as just it's ingrained in the DNA of these characters now or, or in this the tropes of the medium now. Right. But he was the first one. It, it did not happen before him. You know, Lee, yeah. Lee Falk did not do this with the Phantom. Um, Eisner did not do this with the Spirit. It, right. it, it, it stemmed from some type of collaboration with Stan Lee. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, we think about the things that we love. You would not have. You wouldn't have Frank Miller writing Dark Knight Returns, allowing comics to get that gritty, which in that book changed the way we, that comics were written and the way that we read. But you wouldn't have it getting that dark and that gritty if Stan Lee hadn't come along and taken these characters and comics out of the mindset that they were for adolescents alone. Right. Um, he, he really made them into something that I'm going to say, t- you know, he took them out of the hands of children. And it's not that they shouldn't be for children. They still do. But. He also made it on some level okay, or he at least enticed adults into carrying these things with them outside of outside of their elementary, you know, elementary school days, uh, into their teenage years, and into their adulthood. That wasn't happening before that, I don't think. Um, For sure. So it's just I don't man. There's so much. Yeah. All right. So Mike Del Vecchio, uh, my buddy Mike. Hey, buddy. He wants to know in which capacity do we think Stan worked better the creative mind behind some of our most beloved characters 
or as the figurehead and symbol that everyone loved and adored? In, in my opinion, I mean, he worked well in both of them. Um, and I mean, as we discussed, he really uh, kind of set the bar for how we do these characters. So many people out there that only know him at that capacity of like his cameos and being this big figurehead for Marvel right. and everything. Right. And uh, I mean, I, I mean, honestly, and not to put it lightly or anything, but do you do you think we would have as many people like you know, mourning for him and everything. If he didn't make all these cameos or he wasn't the figurehead, like oh, if absolutely he, had, not. yeah. Uh, Cause that's, I mean, that's where, that's where he became most prominent. He was, he was really, as Caleb puts it often, the, uh, the ambassador and everything for, right. for Marvel. Um, you could, you could talk to people all day and like, they wouldn't recognize, you know, most creators and stuff like that. Uh, if they saw him in person, but like, Stan Lee was that person that you you knew because of all of his cameos and all of his public work and everything like that. Absolutely. Um, it was, oh, yeah. yeah, it was just like I I think that I don't know that it really kind of drove him just just being that person that outgoing person for the Marvel community and everything. I agree hundred percent. Like mm-hmm. if I have to pick one to answer the question mm-hmm. because you know obviously both he he was great at both. Yeah, but I if I had to pick one, I would honestly say the ambassadorship mm-hmm. because I know growing up. Uh, when I got into comics, I was a Marvel kid. You couldn't have, you can't tell, I couldn't tell you who Stan Lee was mm-hmm. or that he created the X-Men books I was reading, the Spider-Man books I was reading. But I knew him from the movies. I knew he was a part of Marvel. I mean, I've known, even to this day, I, don't, I couldn't list off everything he created. He's created a bunch. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So I think overall, like the ambassadorship has done more for the broad spectrum of fandom. One of, he was the best. He always had that iconic look, the, the, the aviators and the, the mustache. Mm-hmm. You knew who he was, or at least you knew he was somebody when you saw him. Maybe he didn't know who he was. Mm-hmm. So, like, that ambassadorship, I think, has kind of connected people to the comics through the movies and the other little appearances mm-hmm. he's made. If I had to pick one, I honestly would give to the, the ambassadorship also just because of the uh, the broader um, reach that's mm-hmm. done. But, like I said, as we've already discussed and we're going to discuss <laughs> Even more, you can't, you can't, that doesn't take away from the, the great creator that he was. Kind of that same line. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and put a definite stamp on that. Uh, and, and it's agreeing with you guys that I think his ambassadorship and his role outside of the, the creation of comics definitely, uh, he, he was definitely a better hand at that. And that's not taking anything away from, from his work, but there are, there are other people who took over his characters and arguably did them better. I mean, in the 80 years that we've been reading them, that's, right, that's right. bound to happen. Indeed. But Stan really took off. Like the legend of Stan really took off in the seventies. I think it was 73 when he wrote his last, uh, as a full time, uh, writer and editor, uh, he wrote his last book and he left Marvel and he moved to Hollywood and because he was going to go sell Marvel and he, he did. Uh, he, he moved to Hollywood. He created just this monolith and it didn't take off. You know, he had a lot of failures. It didn't take off until the, the late nineties, early two thousands, but he put these things in front of a mass market that, that wasn't reading the funny books. Um, and so he, like what he did is really like he reached into a space where there was where, where the audience wasn't and he moved everything aside the man moved mountains as an ambassador if that's what we want to call it or just his job at that point because his, his job title had changed but he created things that were leaps and beyond the possibilities of what would have happened if he had simply been writing these scripts or writing these plot right. points uh, so yeah no for me it's hands down like Stan Lee wrote comics Stan the man Lee was comics and that right. didn't happen until he became the unofficial titan of the industry um, oh you know? for sure because I mean even when uh, may have may not been after his writing duties or not but you know he was always a part of Marvel so even before the movie cameo started becoming a thing that you look for in every single comic movie you would watch he had the uh, what's it called the Marvel bullpen mm-hmm where it was an illustration of him. He was he's he was out there being the ambassador even before even while he was still with the company 100%. Yeah, for sure. I mean, you know, the make mine marvel, you know, ex- hell, we learned the word excelsior because of him because that was always like you just see the drawings from him. Like, even before he was a, away from, you know, right. ha- being hands on with Marvel, he was already being the ambassador. Well, he yeah. like put himself out there to just promote it. You can just tell he loves this medium. 
It's like the, the do you remember the Mary Marching Marvel that, Society or the, the, one, yeah. the I forget yeah. if that's the right order I of think those you got words. It. I think you got uh, it. but in a way the man invented like fandom. Like I, I don't know if that's too too broad of a thing to say, or maybe that's just hyperbole. And you know, I'm I'm I'll, prone I'll, to hyperbole, but I'll credit a uh, comic book fandom. Yeah, sure. like specifically like because I think around that era, the closest thing to a real fandom you had was Star Trek. Yeah, because there were Trekkie conventions. Well, that didn't happen until the '60s. So you think even before that? Yeah. Okay. Well, then yeah. Yeah, I thought it was around roughly the same time. No, no. So he started working. He started. He started did, working. Like, you know, like the, when did he actually start really putting out the the Marvel Mary? For, uh, I, I'm not sure about that point, but I know if you read. So if I like, I've got a book in the studio today that you can go back and you can read a lot of the back matter um, from the Amazing Fantasy and the Amazing Spider Man books, and he was already doing it then. Oh, okay. okay. If you look at the covers to those old Silver Age books, he was already doing it. Like he was. He was acting. He was the carnival barker, and I don't say that disparagingly. Yeah. 1964, he, he started the Mary Marvel yeah, Marching Society. Just, okay, yeah, okay. <laughs> um, but doing that uh, to just reach out to to create to make people think it was cool to be a part of a group, yeah, not absolutely. just somebody sitting at home in your dad's chair reading these things, but to be part of a group. Uh, that was really the birth of 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 this of what we're doing right now. It's. It's the birth of, of people getting together at comic book shops and, and talking about the tenets of these things. It's the birth of podcast uh, front groups of friends who want to sit around on, on a Sunday morning and eat shitty food uh, and be hung over <laughs> and, and do that. Like that we wouldn't do that if it wasn't for him because like, and, and I mean, no offense to the memory of these men, but Ditko didn't do that. Jack Kirby didn't do that. Uh, Art, who was Stanley's cousin uncle or whatever it was, he didn't do that. No one else did that, but Stan. Right. And, and and yeah, man. So and he and he didn't do that in the panels. He didn't do that in the plot. He did that in the back matter. He did that in cameos. He did that selling the movies. He did that being the voice of Spider Man on cartoons. He did that in cons. He did that everywhere else. And so for me, yeah, his role off the page is abundantly uh, more important and more functional than the, the work he did on the page, which was pretty goddamn good on its own. Indeed. This is Wendy Freeman from Double Page Spread, and uh, I've had a few days to process the death of Stan Lee now. It's been such an interesting week because it, it's just so funny to have so many non-comic friends try and console you over, <laughs> you know, over over something something like that when, when they had no idea who Steve Ditko was when he died or Bernie Wrightson or so many of the losses that our community has had this year. But definitely Stanley was such a complicated individual and it's all just such a, such a complex life, like, like anyone's life is. But he was tremendous for the industry, for bringing heart and for bringing showmanship. And I think that's what we still need if we hope to ever save our industry. We need more people who will stand up and and make make it known these are the people who create comics and these are this is what we do and this is why we love it so rest in peace Dan Excelsior uh, so Noel uh, our dear friend she asks which of his characters do you feel have had the biggest impact on comics Sean you haven't gone first yet buddy take this one this was a really hard one just because of the in depth of what he brought in, as we discussed earlier, the humanity he brought to every single one of his creations. But I'm going to say Spider-Man. Mm-hmm. I feel like that character alone has, even though X-Men touched on other things that he didn't, but like I think Spider-Man has had the general just effect on everything. Just because, like again, the humanity he brought into a teenage superhero who's not just, you know, Chippy old Robin, no, nothing against Robin, but you know, this, he was just the, the ward, the sidekick, the thing that put him in it. Like the kid could imagine he's next to Batman. Peter Parker, you felt his issue. You probably had his issues. Again, like that, that impacted creator, that impacted people wanting to read comics who weren't, it wasn't just some, you know, oh, Batman's trapped in a uh, whipped cream machine that Joker's going to kill him. You know what I mean? This is like, oh, he's fighting a psychopath with tentacle arms. But he's also got to make his fucking midterm, and his girlfriend hates him right now. Right. And so I'd say Spider Man, of all his creations, probably had the biggest impact on just society and comics in general. Yeah. I mean, that that was my answer as well. Uh, Spider Man. Um, 
huge huge shout out on that one. Um, but I mean, X Men was also was that was that your answer, Caleb? No, no. Oh, well. I mean, there's yeah. no wrong answer yeah. as far as crazy. Yeah, they're, they're like, really, literally they're really everything isn't. did. But yeah, I said because. You, everyone knows at least Wolverine or they associate oh, yeah. Deadpool with an X Men, mm-hmm. but like everyone fucking knows Spider Man. Yeah, yeah. Even if you've never read a comic in your life, you've seen a cartoon, you've seen his blimp in the Macy's Day Parade. Yeah, and then like the X Men, like they all kind of had these these character traits where it's like they're either very human, and it, it that really showed in their superhero personality because they're not like just that superhero; they're they're right. you know human self um and then you get like the x-men where it's all these people that had like gained this mutation and everything and and there were just so many stories about all these very xenophobic people that are just don't like them because they're different and everything like that and i i think you know so many people can kind of relate especially you know nerds growing up uh right. in in the time that we grew up like it was really really frowned upon and like we were made fun of for right. everything oh, like for that. sure i mean yeah. like I, absolutely right. i decided to kind of no, jump right. in on that but it's like yeah just the little mutations about them too mm-hmm. is what it was like even if it's subtle either intentional or not is how i was adapted mm-hmm. to being a big guy wearing glasses cyclops had to have a visor and glasses on it at all times mm-hmm. so he, and, you know he was made fun of like why are you wearing red tinted glasses you freak even though that's normal now <laughs> but <laughs> beast before he was blue and furry, he was right. a big dude with big hands and feet and was made, you know, that made him stand out. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, like, these little things that you can associate being maybe a little different from the norm, quote unquote. So, absolutely. Like, X-Men definitely had that impact. And, but, and I mean, yeah, not, but did you just call Beast a furry? No, I said before he was blue and furry, get back to work, friend. <laughs> get out of here. He might be a furry. You don't know his life. Don't kink shame. But, uh, but also on the, uh, on the X-Men side, even the X-Men yeah. villains. Like, because you saw that other side of the coin of like how wrong it could go, you know, being treated like that and everything. Like, oh, as an and outcast. I would definitely argue, and I could could be wrong, but I would say Magneto damn near being one of the first um, villains you can understand as mm-hmm. hate. Yeah, sympathetic villain. Yeah, thank you. That's, yeah. that's the word I was yeah. trying to think of. <laughs> but uh, but yeah. yeah, that's that's where I'd go. I'd go X Men with mine. Yeah. You can. Um, so I'm cheating on this one. Because I think the character that Stan Lee created that has the most impact on comics is the character that Stan Lee created for himself. It's the character of Stan Lee. Yes, he was such a big figure that he carried a lot of it back and forth. But who we know as fans, um, that's not the Stan Lee that was married to Joan for 70-something years. He had he had a personal life. He had his home life. Of all of the things that Stan Lee sold, uh, <laughs> selling himself was on many ways, his main, uh, his main goal. And it's a, he was very successful at it. So he created this character, this, this energetic, this outgoing, this, uh, <coughs> carnival barker esque character that, you know, somebody who's always seems to have it together. He's always got the answer. He's always smiling. Uh, you know, things are never wrong. Everything's always positive. We're making the, like, you're going to buy this because it's the best thing in the world. And you're, you get it. So that character that he, that he crafted for himself for our benefit on some right. level um, for us, for the fans um, f- so that we can, you know, the, the, the character that you see walking in mall rats, you know, the, the character that you see giving speeches and doing shows with Roy Thomas, you know, from the seventies, just that to me is the character because it's not really him like, like on some level, right. uh, you know, and, and maybe it grew to be, to actually be who he was. Like maybe at some point it took over and that became who he was, but he had to create it, and and and, and it did everything for comics. Uh, you, you know, it's we wouldn't again. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how else to say it. We wouldn't be sitting at at this table if after com- getting done with World War Two and jumping back into his uncle's shop and and being given the reins to it, if Stan Lee hadn't created himself. Um, to sell comics. And I know that's cheating. So, you know, if I'm going to say anything, I'm going to cheat and say the Hulk. Well, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, um, and, and one of the really cool things I feel about his comics that I don't feel like a lot of comics did is he would have that intro where he's kind of like, you know, introducing the story to the audience, yeah. to the, you know, us as true believers and everything like that. Mm-hmm. And it, it was, I just always really kind of like that because you kind of felt like it was almost... You know, you had that relationship 
with the person that's doing this comic and and the characters that are in it and everything and it was just really really stellar like, yeah i mean amazing. you you look at the first page of amazing fantasy 15 which was the first appearance of spider-man mm-hmm. and the first thing you see is a giant text box it's all yellow and it says like costume heroes confidently we in the comics mag business refer to them as long underwear characters and you as you know Think they're a dime and a dozen, or think they're a dime a dozen. But we think you just may find our Spider Man a bit different. You know, you, you can hear his voice, mm-hmm. right. and it, it, it's it's just what you're talking about, Jerry. It's it's that selling the product, even mm-hmm. a product that you've already bought. Arguably, if you're reading it, he's still selling it to you. Yeah, he's never going to stop. Yeah, and 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 he even carried that over to all the animated series too. Yeah, like he would do a bunch of those intros and stuff, and it was just fantastic. No, and 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 what you guys were talking about about earlier. Um, there being such a depth to this character. Stan Lee was a voracious reader of not just uh, comics, but also of just literature. Uh, and so Hemingway, this, this, this came a little bit after Hemingway. But when what made Hemingway awesome is Hemingway's iceberg theory. There's so much under the surface. What you see is 10%. What's under the surface that you only hint at is 90%. And I think Stan Lee took that and gave it the Stan Lee treatment. And so he, he took all of these problems that you know are under the surface and he brought a little bit of them up that had never been above the surface of comics before for you to see. And you still got 10,000 things going on under there. So he took this literary quality that you would find in Hemingway, uh, that you would find in Steinbeck, a little bit in F. Scott Fitzgerald's work, but less so. And he just blasted them like with cosmic rays <laughs> right. to, to give us something in our pop culture figures that is beyond the metaphor. If, if that makes any sense whatsoever, just no, absolutely. Yeah. And, 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 and I think that speaks to his intelligence and it, it really does speak that he always had a vision that's extended out. He always thought that comics as a medium could be more than what it was. And, and I think that he, that was his belief until his dying day. So Melissa Martina, I'm going to keep saying so in front of everybody. I don't know why I do that. <laughs> uh, Melissa R. Martinka. Uh, asks, what do you guys think this world would be like if Stan Lee did not create Marvel? Wow. Uh, <laughs> bleak. <laughs> um, it, so I, I don't know if I can speak to the entire world, but you wouldn't have a multi-billion dollar franchise. Less kids would know that it was okay not to be racist and to, less kids would, would have been encouraged to fight racism. I wouldn't have 80% of the friends that I have. I feel like people wouldn't be as accepting of uh, different qualities and stuff in humans. Yeah, there, there wouldn't be a massive industry. Mm-hmm. Um, honestly, I think that comics in general would have died out in the 70s. Uh, you know, for better or worse, I do credit Stan Lee for being the the vehicle that, that carried the entirety of comics, at least the the entirety of the comics industry as a sellable product through some really bleak times. Um, I I think that they crumble if if not for Stan Lee because if nothing else, Stan like it when it when it lost and and I think the comics industry needs a Stan Lee right now. Uh, when when comics enthusiasm started to die out, it was like Stan Lee was the one who came in kicking the door like the Kool Aid Man, saying, "Oh yeah, yeah, oh well, here's some more cool shit, or here's why. Let me remind you why they're cool." And he really did revitalize it. So man, just bleak. Mm. Oh, absolutely. If nothing else, you can't take away from what he did to uh, promote. You know, as we said, he promoted himself, but also just comics. It was, I don't think we would have gotten, like, even before we could follow our favorite combo creators now on social media, as he said, he was put an introduction as himself in the comics. Right. He made the bullpen, the letter sections. He was really promoting interaction. And I don't think we would have gotten to that. Even if comics... In, is it, you're very well might have been right about the comics dying out. We may have gotten something like Marvel eventually, but it would have been a slow crawl. And I mm-hmm. don't think we would have had as much like knowing the creators like that if he hadn't done all that. Right. Yeah. It was, and it's, you know, really a thing of would, would even DC be that big because they wouldn't have had any, you know, competition or anything. So you almost can credit like, how how popular and how good DC is nowadays to Marvel being there and it being as good as it is. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, everything uh, of what, what you guys said plus that. <laughs> <laughs> when Indeed. Whenever Marvel um, really got into its stride. So you have to remember that there is like a five-year period mm-hmm. when everything got made. 
when the Fantastic Four, Spider-Man, the Hulk, uh, Black Panther, uh, Galactus, just all of these characters, there's like a five-year window where those things were birthed into existence by Stan and Steve and Jack. Any point after that time, everything else uh, was carried by Marvel. And I know there's some DC fans out there who are going to roll their eyes at that. And, and I don't think you have to pick one or the other. I'm not saying that. But ever like anything post that, that little golden window of time, Marvel carries everything. Like the, the only things before that were when Marvel or Timely or Action or whatever it was called um, were kind of the second best. Everything past that, uh, you, you talk to comic shop owners now and their, their business is a reflection on how well Marvel is doing. If you look at the sales numbers monthly, and you can, they're online. It, it, it may come close, and I'm sure throughout history there's been a time or two where there's been some months where DC has outperformed, but uh, you look at the very rare. Uh, Marvel's always leading the way. And so, uh, yeah, man, just without Marvel, you, you don't have the industry, at least in the past 60 years, I don't think. I don't even want to think about a world without that didn't have a Stanley in it. Mm-hmm. Just because we like we wouldn't be here, man. Indeed. Kind of talk about it like uh, Marvel is the all beat all. But I mean, I, I kind of feel like it's almost that, that same direction where like if there were no DC, would Marvel be as good as it is? I don't know. Yeah. Uh, that, you know so, I mean, there's, there's a DNA to the product, mm-hmm. right? So... <laughs> You look and, and if you look at things now, you always we always look at how Marvel or DC have copied one another and how they've evolved the things. Mm-hmm. So it's really hard to say if you know if there hadn't have been a DC, would have would there have been a Marvel? Well, no, probably not. But there wasn't a Marvel, there there wouldn't be a DC now. But you could also go back and say if there wasn't pulp character, you know, if there wasn't a, if there wasn't a Will Eisner, I don't think that you, there there's a Marvel. If there's not a Lee Fault. Um, creating the phantom mm. then there's not a marvel if there's and it goes beyond comics you can look at the old pulp books if there's not a robert e howard then there's no comics if there's not a tarzan doesn't come into the picture then there is no there is no fa- tar, if there's no tarzan then there's no phantom then there's no masked superheroes um then there is no marvel so you look at the dna of, of those things and it's really it's a Jenga tower, right? So if you right. if you lose if you pull one piece out, the whole thing crumbles. Um, like like are most things in life, I think if you really dissect them. Oh, for sure. Like if st- and as far as like talking about like would DC be what it is, I firmly believe no. I don't believe they would have changed from the cookie cutter <laughs> mm-hmm. kind of like I'm sorry. If you go back and read old DC books and even some old Marvels, to be fair, but a lot of like the early Superman where he literally would have a new power for whatever situation, right? I believe that would have changed and, and that would have eventually lost their fan base. As we discussed earlier, how Stan was creating characters that will last you through the years. Mm-hmm. I don't believe teenagers and adults were, were not many, not as many were reading goofy Superman and goofy Batman books and competition breeds genius. Right. Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll compare that to the Monday night wars of pro wrestling. If WCW hadn't stolen a shitload of WWF's talent, mm-hmm. And started killing them in the ratings. WWF wouldn't have bought them years later right. after the war ended mm-hmm. because it made Vince McMahon get off his ass and start like, "We need to rethink things." Right. So, absolutely, uh, with a, a world without Stanley and his contributors and creating what they did to change the comic industry, yeah, I think it would have definitely floundered. Mm-hmm. So, this is actually a great a great point to move on to the next the next question that's going to tie into it a little bit. It comes from um, Denard Jollier or, or Stewart. I'm not sure. Stewart. Yeah, Stewart. Okay. Hey, Denard. Um, so, do you think that Stan Lee would have been as prolific at DC Comics? And the second parter um, to this question, do you think that he would be such an icon without the help of Jack uh, Kirby or Steve Ditko? Ooh, uh, no. no. Because I don't think... So, So part of the reason that, that Stan Lee got to be Stan Lee is because he was working for a company that was... Like, uh, it's nepotism, right? Like he worked for a company that his uncle owned. Mm-hmm. So he, he got through with the army because uh, he had he had gone into the army, uh, was in World War II. He never went overseas and fought. He was actually listed as a playwright right. uh, because he was a writer. Uh, his claim to fame for the longest time was this poster. It was for a VD. It, <laughs> it, <laughs> it was, it was well, I mean, yeah. look, I mean, so GIs are some fucking motherfuckers. Yeah. Uh, they were going overseas and they were alone, the, you know, in the middle of violence, there were women. They were they were doing some fucking, and they were getting some VD. 
And so it was a problem. So they came to Stan and the, the army did and was like, Hey, your, your job right now is to design uh, basically a propaganda poster to get soldiers to like go get checked or to number one, to stop doing this, but to go get checked before they come home and give this shit to their wives. Uh, and so he did, he came up with this poster and it says VD, not me. Uh, <laughs> and that was his claim to fame for the longest time. Right. But if he had have been at DC, <laughs> Uh, he wouldn't have been at a company that was owned by his uncle. He wouldn't have been one of the only paid employees, like not a freelancer at that company. He, he probably would have been one of the guys who got fired. So one of the things that a lot of people who who don't like Stanley or who who have take issue with some of the things is that Stanley fired everyone. Uh, but the backside of that story is is the owner of the company who was his uncle cousin. Again, I'm not real sure. Um, came in one day and said, hey, Stan, uh, fire everyone. I'm going to Florida for vacation. L- literally how it went. He said, hey, fire everyone. I want them all fired. By the time I get back, I'll be in Florida. Deuces. Uh, and so Stanley did that, had to do that. Uh, you know. Now, whether or not he took any joy in doing that or whether or not he should have stood up and said, no, fuck you, uncle cousin. I'm not doing it. Well, I'll go with him. You know, that's that's all hindsight. But, you know, as we're going to talk about the Peter Parker syndrome, sometimes you got to do some shit you don't want to do to pay the bills. Uh, and so he did that. And if he had been at D.C., he wouldn't have been in that position. Ergo, he would have been the person who got fired uh, in that situation. And he also wouldn't have had the the free reign and the licensure to branch out and do his own thing. Like, I don't think it. So at the time, D.C. was publishing, uh, you know, they, they had their Superman and the Batman. But the big books at that time were Westerns. The big like the big books were uh, romance novels, which Stan wrote plenty of in his own um but like he wouldn't have had the opportunity to say, you know what, I'm fixing to quit. Before I quit, let me let me do the Fantastic Four uh, before this goes under, and and we'll see what happens. So so no, um, do I th- think he would be an icon without the help of Jack Kirby and Steve Ditko? No, but I don't think you would know Jack Kirby or Steve Ditko without the help of Stan Lee. Hmm. Uh, so I think that they have a codependent, at least their fame and their 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 prolification has a codependent aspect to it uh, that. No, you don't. You don't really have one without the other. Without without the amazing artwork of of Jack the King Kirby, and without his ability to draw like ninety pages a day or some shit. And I think it was actually like he, he would do fifteen pages in a day was his most at one point. That's insane. Right. Um, you don't put out the content, and it doesn't look as good. And one might argue that the plots don't get fully fleshed out the way that they did, and and many have argued that, and I think rightfully so. Uh, but yeah, you, you you don't have one without the other, and we we don't talk about him in 2018 if he doesn't, if if Jack doesn't have Stan, if Steve doesn't have Stan, and if Stan doesn't have Jack or Steve, you know you don't you don't talk about those names today. Uh, it's again, it's looking at a world without Stan Lee. What would that be like? Um, I also don't want to think about a world without Jack Kirby or or Steve Ditko. I could have done without some of Steve Ditko's insane uh, political views, but you don't have the one without the other. Yeah, and I mean, I 100 percent agree with that. The only thing I can honestly say, though, is I believe Stan's writing would come across even with a less talented artist. Yeah. Now, like I said, full credit to all the people who created this stuff, for sure. But, like, a good writer will make you look past mediocre art. Great art doesn't always make up for bad writing. Fair. Yeah, I think... So, like, I, it, like I said, I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with you at all. No, no, for sure. But if I had to take a little bit of a, a stance, I think Stan would have been prolific without them. Because he would have found a good artist and got a role in with the, uh, as far as like working with Marvel. DC, yeah. no, I think he would have floundered in one of the stories he would want to write. And without his uncle cousin to kind of like, hey, make sure you pay attention to his writings, he may not have gotten that time to shot. Right. For sure. I don't think he would have done well in DC. But I don't, I think he still would have found a way to get his stories out there, even without Ditko and uh, Kirby. Yeah. So I can argue that. Uh, Two things before I give my answer. <laughs> I really need a Google search on if it was his uncle or his cousin. <laughs> no, I don't want to know until the end of the show. I'm keeping two, this rolling. And two, I really want a t-shirt that says Stanley presents VD, not me, and have Excelsior underneath it. We can make that happen, actually. I really, we I really think I happen. need that in my life. Um, as being a, a fanboy of uh, alternate universes and alternate storytelling, right. I would honestly like to see... Um, I don't know personally if he would do better at DC, but I would really like to have seen the characters that he would have created. Yeah. Well, he's, do you, he's like, do you, do you think that it still would have been Fantastic Four or Spider-Man? Do you think those characters would have fit into the DC universe? 
I, say, do, I, do I think? I, I don't think they would. If I can, no, go ahead. Sorry, sorry I didn't mean to I, those. I don't think we, at least at the time mm-hmm. of when, like, say, when he started Fantastic Four over in DC, mm-hmm. I think we would have gotten a superhero group of scientists who never fight with each other, who mm-hmm. never have family issues mm-hmm. and all that. Like, we may have the Fantastic Four, but we won't have the human side. Yeah, because like, and granted, I'm not an expert in this era of comics. I haven't read a lot, mm-hmm. but what I can tell from DC at that time, that's not what they were wanting. They were yeah. just one fun bubblegum comic, which yeah. are great in their own. Sense. Sense. Right, but it's not what it's not the prolific creation that Stan was doing at Marvel. Mm-hmm. Spider Man would have been a Spider Guy. He would have had all. He may have had a cape. DC like capes uh, sideways, <laughs> uh, right? Mm-hmm. And but but he wouldn't be a troubled teen nerd. You know, geek, worried well, about getting the girl. Not necessarily sideways. He's a troubled teen now. But you know what I mean. Yeah. Okay, what yeah, I'm getting yeah, at, like yeah. they may have existed, but they wouldn't be what they are. Yeah. yeah. I, I think I, I still would argue the humanity of them wouldn't be there. Yeah. He, I mean, because because Stan kind of brought that though. Do you do you think like I DC think the edit, editors? I think the editors yeah, would have been like, "Look, dude, that's too real. We're yeah. just making fantasy popcorn bubblegum." Yeah, he comics. wouldn't. He wouldn't have had the the yeah. office clout to do that. Yeah. But yeah. yeah. So to to. To well, carry through without his cousin uncle, right? Without, <laughs> yeah. Um, you also have to try to. So Stan Lee has written some stuff for DC. We can see what Stan Lee. I mean, they weren't very good, to be honest. Um, you can, but they happened later on in his life too. They weren't when he was really had all his cylinders popping. Um, so you can see a little bit of that. But you also, if you look at the history of the characters and the history of the people working there. So Jack Kirby was working for DC. Uh, He went and worked for DC for a while after um, what's his face, uncle cousin fired him. Um, And, and he eventually came back and that's when some of these things got created. But while he was at DC, he worked on a book and for the life of me, I'm blank right now. I can't think of what it was. It was a lot like the fantastic four. It was basically a concept of, of like those types like the figures. blueprints of that. Yeah. And, and so that's where, again, I think you have to give him some of the credit for this. Like it's not all Stan, but mm-hmm. a lot of it's Stan. But it didn't have the, the human, like it did what they weren't a family. They were just kind of like, cause Stan, uh, Jack Kirby was a big sci fi guy, right? So he was reading all these like werewolves on the moon, um, Nazis at the center of the earth shit. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> and so he, he had tried to create that at DC. And it didn't, like you, like you said, and I think it, like it, number one, it didn't have Stan Lee, but number two, those characters didn't work at DC, mm-hmm. uh, under, under that model. You, again, you, you have to, to look at, so part of what <laughs> the big fallout from, um, between Jack and, and Stan, um, when Stan was in charge and part of what got Jack fired, uh, one of the times, I forget if it was the first time or the second time is Jack was, f- moonlighting for DC while contracted with Marvel and the story. So basically they had an apartment rented. He and one, I think it was Simon. It was, I think it was who he created uh, because it was Kirby and Simon. I think that created Captain America. And so those two people had actually rented an apartment down the street, like two blocks over from the Marvel offices where they, where they worked during the day and during their lunch breaks. And this speaks to how amazing and quick Jack Kirby was. During their lunch breaks, they would go to this apartment and they would work for DC. Hmm. Somebody found out about it and it was probably Stan and Stan went and reported back to uncle cousin and got them fired. And, and so that was part of what, what did that. But what, what they were creating were these, were these characters that in some way were the seeds of what would become, uh, the Fantastic Four, maybe Spider-Man. And they tried them at DC and they just didn't work. So, so yeah, I mean, I think we've repeatedly mm-hmm. said the same thing. I just wanted to throw in some of that history for context, Indeed. but you just, yeah, it, it doesn't work not at Marvel and, and Kirby. I mean, so I know people who love the fourth world stuff. Um, but I still argue that Kirby's greatest things came out of Marvel and that a lot of the stuff that Kirby wrote himself while it was again, pretty was what Sean was saying. It wasn't necessarily good. <laughs> it was pretty, but not good. I do want to tack this on just be, just to acknowledge my possible lack of knowledge. Uh, I traditionally think of writers and artists of contributing artists is the art writer is creating the characters and writing the stories. Kirby and, uh, Dicko may have contributed more to the writing than I know oh, they, of. Yeah, they did. So I'm not really sure. But like I said, to, I just want to clarify, like, I may be discredited in how much they attributed to the writing aspects of, of what Stanley contributed to. But I still, like I said, I feel like he would have got his writing out there even without them. Well, so, okay. So this is actually a, a good place to, to say, to kind of talk about that. So right. in, in comics writing, there are essentially two ways that we, that are 
typically thought of to write to write the scripts. One of them is a full script, so you write it, you know, panel one, page one, this is what happens, and you're, it's the writer talking directly to the artist, and he lays out the full story and, and, and page by page, panel by panel for the artist. That's the that, that's kind of the, the usual model. Then you have what Stan Lee created, and it's not used very often now. Every once in a while it is. I want to say that it was how um, Fraction and AHA wrote the, the Hawkeye series that they wrote, but it's called the Marvel Method. And it was kind of invented by Stan. And so what Stan would do, because Stan was so freaking busy, like you got to remember, he was the only employee and uh, for a long time, the only writer at a company, quote unquote writer, at a company that was putting out like 30 books a month. Right. And so what he would do is he wouldn't write these full scripts. He invented the Marvel method, which was he would write a paragraph and he would say, all right, so here's what's going to happen in this issue. Our hero is going to swing in. There's going to be a lady who's getting hit by a car and he's going to save her. And then he's going to go over here and there's going to be, you got to throw Jonah, Jada, throw Jonah in there. And Jonah's got a problem. We don't really know what it is. Um, he's going to look concerned on this page. The chameleon's going to show up. Spider-Man is going to fight him for three pages and this is going to happen. Uh, and here's how it ended. And so then the, the artist, Jack or Steve, they would take that and they would make a 30 page book out of it. Okay. And so they would, they, they, they would, to their credit, they would write a lot of what would happen. And then uh, Stan would go back in and fill in the dialogue. He would do all the text boxes and he would, he would, he would write the story. But the idea came from Stan's brain. It was right. fully realized in a visual uh, language by the artist. And then the words, the letters, and the the context was put in again by Stan. And okay. so it was. It, it. I mean, it's a collaborative medium. Oh yeah, yeah. I knew that. And I wasn't trying to take anything away from. No, him. for sure. But like, I just, I feel, I still feel like the end. If he had to like say Woody or wouldn't he, I think he absolutely would. Yeah. Still be very prolific. Oh yeah. Them. Craig, Craig just uh, just came out to uh, to grab some breakfast and then saw his shadow. So I guess we're in for <laughs> six more months of uh, of winter. <laughs> <laughs> and he shrugged. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we've got another one from Nick. And Nick wants to know which character do you think would give the best or most fitting eulogy for him? And a follow-up to this, uh, which one do you think he would have wanted to do so? Spider-Man. Uh, Craig, Craig <laughs> says Spider-Man I, from the dungeon. That, that, was, that was one of mine. I've got yeah. two more, though. No, um, Spider-Man for sure. I'm going to say a character that he didn't create, but it's Captain America. It's certainly a character that he played with a lot mm-hmm. um, and that he loved. But, uh, I mean, if... if Hell, if I could think of any superhero that I would want to give my eulogy, it would be Cap. Yeah, um, for sure. Or just Hulk standing up on the podium saying smash. Uh, but <laughs> no, if you want, if you want something eloquently stated about the importance of a man who fought, literally, who was part of the military. So in some way he fought for freedom, who really brought the concepts of fighting against bigotry, um, both in his stories and in the back matter. He didn't min- mince words. He straight up said, Hey, racist or shitty. Um, I would want that person to be Steve. I, said, I kind of just wanted to assume it would be like somebody he created, but you're absolutely right. Captain America is definitely fitting. Of his creations, I think Spider-Man yeah. would definitely be a very fitting uh, to give the eulogy. Mm-hmm. And honestly, uh, part of the question was which one do you think he would have wanted to mm-hmm. do it? Uh, I just kind of want to mention something I found out when we were uh, kind of reading about it is that you know he he has been buried already and he yeah. by his request it was a small no public like private a very private event. funeral yeah. so yeah I, I honestly I don't, I don't know if he would want anybody other than his family his creation you know what I mean kind of mm-hmm. kind of get a little real with it that makes mm-hmm. sense um, but I feel like out of all his creation in which he he put him uh, you know you, you put your part of yourself in there when you're creating writing and stuff for sure mm-hmm. uh, just out of everyone. It's just, I think Spider-Man is the most human. Peter Parker. Uh, uh, yeah. yeah. I think he would be uh, the one. He, he actually uh, gave the eulogy at Flash Thompson's uh, funeral. Oh, okay. And like, oh, Flash, oh, yeah. that had me cracking up. Um, but the uh, the other two that I had, um, just because, I don't know, I, I think that the, the characters can be very, uh, very deep uh, when, when written well. Um Honestly, kind of want to go with like a villain, like uh, Magneto or Doctor Doom or something. Okay. Just, um, but then the other one, I, I think that would be really well done. Uh, would be like the Watcher, because the Watcher would see like all the events in your life. So I think the uh, the Watcher would be really, you know, give a really good eulogy uh, yeah. for somebody. Just just of 
all of the important events in your life and, and everything that you've done and achieved and everything over it. I just really like the thought of that. So if, yeah. if we have to, if the, if we are if the rule is that it has to be a character that he created, mm-hmm. I think the thing yeah. would be oh. who I would go with. If you're thinking about the, the original team, uh, his original creations, the, the group of these characters he created first, it's the fantastic four, right? Mm-hmm. It's, right. it's Reed and Sue, but you know, Reed is not an emotional person most of the time. And when he does allow his emotions to sink in, things usually are going really, really badly. Maybe Sue, but I don't know that Sue, uh, she's definitely a leader. She's definitely assertive, but definitely not Johnny because Johnny's mm-hmm. a hothead. He's just going to be an emotional wreck. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I think our favorite blue eyed boy would, would just kill it. He, he's really, yeah. and it's, it's kind of crazy to, well, not necessarily crazy to think about, but he is the most human out of that entire no, oh, yeah, yeah, other than, than Johnny. But like, yeah, he you know has the the most emotion, and he had the most that he lost. And yeah. Everything, so yeah. and and you know Ben has Ben has a way with words, and and, and it's not always the most eloquent, and sometimes <laughs> it is just gravelly, pun intended, uh, street level language. But I think Stan would be down with that, and and yeah. I think like. Yeah, man. Like I, I'm gonna say bet. the thing. Absolutely. I definitely want him carrying the casket. No, oh, like sure. a, like he he would need to be the pallbearer. At least one of them. Absolutely. How you doing? My name's Tyler May, and Stanley meant a lot to me. I've been a comic book fan ever since I could walk. Ever since I could read, Spider Man has been such an influence on me growing up. And seeing the man who was behind it meant a lot. Words can't express what what Stan means to me. Uh, I know I'm just a fan and. He never met me, but he he's really moved me and touched me. Um, I'm happy he's in a better place now. I'm glad that he was born. He was the homer in our current generation, making the Odyssey with his Marvel creations. And uh, I miss him. Excelsior! All right, so, and then I think this is the last one, and at least that I have, and I haven't seen anything else pop up on social media yet. Right. Uh, it comes from Tyler May, uh, who is a dear friend of the show. What are three principles from Stan Lee's life that you apply to your life today, whether it's from his comics or his personal life? I'll kick us off with this one because I think this one's going to take a little bit of time. So the first one is to be timeless. Stan Lee wrote about things that, you, you know, some, some of his characters and some of his creations and some of the things that they did, if you read back on now, they're definitely... They're a product of their time, but fighting bigotry is never going to go out of style. Confidence is never going to go out of style. Making your characters human is never going to go out of style. Uh, so, and these these things that he made are timeless. And even the character, you know, while Stan's body may not have been timeless, spirit certainly was. So yeah, so so be timeless. Like look at look at the way that you live your life in a way that is never going to. Uh, be on the wrong side of history. The second one is to to treat. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, it's okay, brother. To treat the love of your life like they are actually the love of your life. Stan Lee loves himself, and there, so that's that's no secret. There's only one person that I would argue that Stan Lee loved more than himself, and that's his wife Joan. Todd McFarlane put out a post the other day on social media, and he was actually able to go sit with Stan a few, about a month before he passed away. And Stan just kept saying, you know, I'm ready to go see Joan. I'm ready to go see Joan. That has nothing to do with the creations at his, uh, th- that, that he made at Marvel or anything else. That's a man who was missing the other half of his soul. And they were married for 75 years. That, that baffles me. My, my own grandparents, I think they were getting close to that mark um, when my grandma passed away. But, you know, they, they, were, they, they were each other's right hand. And Stan and Joan were that way. They had a connection. That and it wasn't a fairy tale story, but it was certainly the thing, the, one of the most beautiful things in in life, especially in their life. When Stan was getting ready to quit Marvel, because uh, he was so fed up of just writing these like piggyback stories, like you know, for a long time Marvel was the second best at everything. That was their claim to fame. Jones like, hey, look, if you're gonna quit, just write one more story and do it the way you want to. And that story was the Fantastic Four. She had a confidence in her husband, and her husband had a confidence in her. They knew. That despite no matter what happened, that they were there for one another. And, you know, my, my husband is my best friend. I have zero plans of living in a world where he's not in it. I can't, like, I, I can't fathom that. 
And I, I don't think, I think that there's a reason why Stan lived barely a year after Joan died. You, you, a plant can't survive without water and sunlight. And th- like, that's, that's what she was to him. Um, so bring that into your own life. And that's something that you can learn. I don't know that it's the only place, the only place that you can learn that is not from Stanley. You can look at other examples. I, know I just talked about my grandparents, but it's certainly something that you can learn from Stanley and you should. And the last thing is that the mighty should stand up for those who can't be mighty. Superheroes, you know, in a lot of cases, they don't, they don't have to be these big hulking figures. I mean, Peter Parker is certainly a frail frame guy, despite the fact that he does have spider powers, but everything, no matter what they are, uh, is, is they get these powers and it's the, you know, the whole with great power comes great responsibility. If you have power, if you are mighty, you have, are honor bound by some semblance of social contract to stand up for those who aren't. And if you don't, you're a piece of shit. Uh, just, Full stop. Like if, if you if you see that your own personal power as a way to take advantage of others or a way to only benefit yourself, then you're not doing life right. And and you see that in Stan's characters. Um, you see that in in Pete, and you see that in in in, in Cyclops and in, in in the X Men. Even his villains, Magneto. So so many times, so many of the clashes are that these mighty figures are fighting for people who can't be mighty. They're just doing it in really, really poorly conceived ways. Uh, Magneto is, is a character. I think that was a retcon at some point, but you can see that in his history. Um, and, and that came out of Stan. Those are my three. Well, I'm not even going to try to follow that up. <laughs> that was beautifully said, sir. Three things I could definitely say I would take from there and encourage is uh, the passion for creativity. Yeah. Like he was, a, he loved creating stories and characters and he encouraged others to do so. So I would definitely say one of the tendencies there is to not only be creative, but to encourage creation from others as well. Confidence in your own product. I suffer from that issue as we discussed before about my drawings and whatnot. He was never shy about saying, Hey, I created something awesome. You should check it out. And to have that kind of confidence and believe it in your, your creations and mm-hmm. your ideas. And even though, like I said, people, like, I'm not trying to give too much attention to the detractors on this kind of episode, but like, even the ones who said he was all about himself, even if he promoted his story, that put other people on the map too. Right. Like you said, there was no Ditko without Lee and there was no Kirby without Lee, and vice versa. You know, like I said, it was all, he may have been putting his face out there, but he was promoting a brand, a, a collaborative effort. And he was, and that's the final thing. Is, like I said, whether he had to fire because his cousin uncle told him to fire everyone, and whether he liked it or not, we can't say that we weren't there. But working with others to um, uh, enhance each other, right? To be there to work to, because like I said, he he trusted them enough. Obviously, he created the Marvel method, whether out of desperation, but it was also out of faith in his coworkers that they could take his paragraph and make a thirty-page book, and then he could. They could work together. He had faith in that, and they worked off each other. So, it was, like I said, just a lot of his like I take a lot of his stuff from his create his creative standpoints and apply it to life as well as like I said everything you said. You said way better than I ever could. <laughs> no, brother, that's not true at all. But yeah, so believe in yourself. Be, uh, believe that there are people out there that will like you. This is speaking to the creators out there who want to put out their their ideas, their their art, their passions. Uh, this that he wanted he wanted you to believe that you can do this and go out there and do it. Very cool. I think mine's going to be a little more simplistic. <laughs> okay, <laughs> but uh, the uh, just the the three things that I had were um, stand up for what you believe in. Mm-hmm. He just really uh, really made a good kind of point of that in a lot of his his comics, and you know, stand up for who you are would would be. You know, an, another thing that I, I kind of took from it, like be yourself mm-hmm. for sure. Um, don't don't be afraid of uh, being different than other people. Everyday people are just trying to be, you know, the others in the crowd and not really letting their their creative side come out or their their differences. Like they're afraid of um, people looking at them like they're like they're different um, and making fun of them. Just just be that that person that you want to be. Then I don't know. I don't really can't really think of a third one that you guys didn't say. Can I steal uh, one? Can go, I, can go, I, yeah. Always alliterate. Yeah. Never be bashful because mm-hmm. that's alliterating too. Yeah. Mm. And never be afraid to uh, laud language. Mm-hmm. Just make them big. 
What do I those wanted, words mean? I just wanted to alliterate. Well, exactly. Yeah, you read yeah, Stan Lee's stuff, yeah. and he throws out some crazy, mm-hmm. uh, some some voracious vernacular, man. Excelsior. Uh, ex- yeah. <laughs> Excellent Excelsior, Sean. <laughs> it's, there's there's so much to learn within all of his characters yep. and everything. Smash. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Th- those were great, and I'm really glad that we, we got the, the turnout for people asking us questions going to help do that, because... Again, Stan Lee, he was all of ours, right? On some level, the, the character and the idea of Stan belongs to us all. And so I, I'm really glad you guys sent those questions in. This is uh, Mike, everybody call me Castro. Stan, uh, Stan's passing probably hit me super hard. Gene Wilder, Tupac, and Stan Lee are probably the most influential people that I've had in my life, as in male figures, since I didn't really have a father around. I always tell people all the time that Tupac raised me. I got to try to live life to the fullest from Willy Wonka, and Stan gave me all the imagination. I mean, I can remember seeing Stan Lee from all those old cartoons from... Uh, the Superhero Hour with Spider-Man, Incredible Hulk, and uh, the old Fantastic Four cartoons. I don't know, it hit me really, really hard, man. I just, this guy gave me a whole universe to escape to. And uh, I don't know if he'll ever know how appreciative and how grateful I am as a fan that I got a chance to, you know, explore the world he created and actually escape with certain characters who had the same issues and the same goings on. As I do. I mean, for that, I, I can forever be grateful. So I, I consider Stan, even though I, I never got a chance to know him or get a chance to meet him like I wanted to, I consider him somebody who helped shape what I got going on in life. I mean, he opened my eyes to a lot of different people, a lot of different friends. If it wasn't for, for him, I probably wouldn't have a lot of the friends I have now. And uh, I mean, I, I just humbly and... Uh, Gratefully, I'm honestly going to miss him. And uh, like I said the other day on my post, I think Valhalla has, has gotten one of the greatest heroes it possibly ever can get. And I know they say heroes and villains always die, but legends live forever, and that's what he'll always be. And I just thank him so very much. Excelsior! And so I've got one more that I wanted to throw out there. What did Stan Lee mean to you guys? And I, I, I think that that should maybe be the title of this episode because that's essentially what we're all talking about. But I just wanted to include that as, as a point um, to, to, to ask what Stan Lee meant to you guys. Stan Lee was one of my heroes, like I, I like full fledged, like uh, was he problematic a, a little bit? Was he perfect? No, I learned so much. He was a teacher. He was a friend. He was an entertainer. He was, he was a hero, man. And in a world where, you know, I, I don't know about you guys, but, you know, I kind of feel like all my heroes are dead. My enemies are in power sometimes. <laughs> um, but Stan Lee has always been that. He, he's, he's an old friend that I, I, that's been there my entire life. Um, I, I don't know, man. There's so much that the, it, it's hard to say. Like, and I don't have many of those people left in my life um, as far as like a celebrity figure, um, you know. I could, I could think of a few George Perez from comics, um, Tom Waits, maybe as far as just being weird and awesome and producing great music. But, you know, Stan Lee was that like he was an icon. In many ways, he was a father figure, at least to me. What about you guys? What did. Is there anything else out there that we have? <laughs> <laughs> Let's say what, what haven't we said about this man? Um, yeah. the Kind of going back on the last question we got from Tyler. Uh, creator. That's a creative influence. Like that he. When he had these ideas and he want, he did everything he could to make them happen. And yeah. that's, that's inspiring that, you know, even if you think your ideas are dumb, if you don't think anyone will ever read them, you still got to do it. And he was, ne- and you got, and you, <laughs> as an artist, you're your own worst critic, but you also have to be your, your best advocate. You have to uh, be out there and whether you think you only sell one drawing at a con, be out there and pimp your shit <laughs> as best you can. Stan was never afraid to, neither should you. Right. So definitely an influence on the creative side. Yeah. Um, what he meant to me, he was always just that kind of like really crazy, outgoing, like kind of kooky guy that narrated my morning cartoons and everything. Yeah. And he always, it always seemed like uh, from what I've seen, you know, in social media and everything, that he always made time <coughs> for his fans. You know, he was always going to conventions. Whereas like, you know, you have a lot of creators that are just, won't put themselves out there or won't have time for it. Like he, 
essentially did that up until the year of his, you know, yeah. of his death. Like, and that's just really incredible to me that he would, you know, put that much time and, and having that presence out there for the people and everything. Um, and it, it's just, I don't know, just says a lot about the, uh, about the person and how much he cared, uh, for, for every, uh, everybody that buys his comics and watches his movies and everything like that. It was just, um, Oh, really, really great. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, man, just, wow. Uh, I hate saying this. Rest in peace, Stan. Mm-hmm. Uh, hang out with those Eternals in the sky, man. Um, slap Galactus on the back for me. <laughs> uh, and, you know, appreciate it, dude. <laughs> uh, thank you for the memories and thank you for the life. Uh, so let's get smothered covered in comic. How you guys feel? Let's talk, let's talk yeah. about some funny books. Right. Um, so, we're not going to talk about books that came out this week. Uh, we're going to keep this within the theme and spirit of a Stan episode. Um, and so we are going to talk about something that it, it may not even be a comic. I don't know what you guys are bringing to the table, but we're going to talk about something that Stan created just as part of our smothered covered in comic section. So Sean, what you got, brother? Uh, well, granted, it wasn't necessarily his era of writing that brought me into comics. But his creation was a big part. I've said many times before that I'm a, I was a Marvel kid and specifically I was an X-Men kid. So like, I want to talk about his creation of the X-Men and the meaning behind them and what it's held on. Like, as I said, like, I came in during more of the Claremont era, mm-hmm. but it wouldn't have been a Claremont era if Stan didn't create the X-Men. He wanted to create the X-Men as not only just another superhero team, but a unique superhero team with the fact that they weren't created by some chemical or scientific or space related accident, they were born different. Mm -hmm. And that touches on so many levels of society of just like, you know, from, I said, being just from being a person of color to just being born with a physical disability to just being born, not straight. You know, I mean, there's anything a society could judge you on. He created some badass superheroes who have to deal with that. Cause like I said, they, they didn't choose. They didn't like go to some weird experiment. They were just born and then they're ostracized for it. So not only does that have that kind of impact, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Magneto, you know, the first villain on the first cover is a sympathetic villain, mm-hmm. which also was just so different from just evil Lex Luthor who just wants to kill Superman and rule the world, which is every single of that era. A lot of villains are just, Mustache I, just to, I just want to rule the world and tie women to train tracks. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? He brought in a man who hated humanity because he was a, I don't know if it was necessarily Auschwitz, but it was, he was in Jewish internment camp. Mm-hmm. And that, he saw the same hate from Nazis that he saw for just being born different. So you can sympathize with that. So X-Men just, it was, and beyond all that, the deeper aspects of it, just on the surface level, it was a cool fucking superhero team. Yeah. I mean, you had a man shooting beams out of his eyes that he can't control because I've always been a fan of powers with consequences, you can mm-hmm. say. Like an Achilles heel. Yes, absolutely. The As we mentioned before, like when you're talking about writing Superman, it gets boring because he's he can he has laser eyes too, but he can turn them off. Mm-hmm. He didn't got to wear fancy shades or if they get broken, he's fucked. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, you had Jean Grey, who was just like a, a beginning psyche, like, you know, right. she... But even then, I think if I remember right, in the early days, it's like she would sometimes read minds accidentally, like she couldn't quite control it. And that was also the beauty of it; that they were like up and coming heroes. You had a uh, angel who just he couldn't hide those giant fucking wings, <laughs> like he just literally walk around with giant wings. He could not hide it, so it kind of made him other than stuffing under a bulky trench coat. I still like, haven't figured out how that works. I don't <laughs> because comics. <laughs> yeah, Beast who. Being a big guy myself, most of my life, I related to just he was big hands, big feet guy before the, the chemical experiment later on turned him into the blue furry beast we all know and love. And then Iceman was fairly normal, the normal kid. Bobby was, and but he could turn into a giant snowman, right? <laughs> at will, but and every one of them, at least for the time, especially that was a unique team build. You know, like, they didn't necessarily complement each other. They all just had unique powers that he made work. So, and I think that was a, in my my, my opinion, that that's a, a good blueprint for a lot of team books that came after. Yeah. Like, you know, you didn't necessarily have to have 
well, Batman can fly, so we need someone in the sea. We need someone in the ground. You know what I mean? Like, you could think of it like that. But X-Men were just like, I want to give him this power and think of a creative way to work that in with someone else's. Yeah. So I think this X-Men is just a, what, a seminal book, as we all know. And like I said, you got the deeper meanings behind it. You got that's a great team book. And it, and they also still had those issues that they would argue. Cyclops has always been a bit of a dick as he was becoming the leader. And he would butt heads with some of the other members. Professor X being kind of the, the stern father figure back then, was, uh, being an all-powerful mutant. And like I said, it, not only did it lay the great groundwork, or not only was it a great groundwork to, to begin with, it inspired and then like put into the hands of others. It beat this became the monster that it is. And yeah. X-Men is just an amazing franchise altogether. And we wouldn't have it to stand in and create them and just want to kind of make a book about a, a group of kids learning to deal with powers they were born with and being ostracized for it. So it was great alliteration and, too, by the way. Thank you. Um, so I have to ask you, uh, which do you like better? OG beast or blue beast? Blue beast. Blue beast. Uh, as I admit, I'm, I'm a, I'm a Claremont era. Actually, even though I think it was, was it early X Factor when he turned blue, or was I, that X Men? I don't, I don't really remember. Maybe, but blue, um, blue furry beast, but not when he's drawn with the Wolverine hair. I, uh, <laughs> I, I think, I think I like OG Beast better. Uh, he thick. I like it. Oh, don't get me wrong. And he's actually, to be honest, because like I said, I, I grew up. With, beast was very blue by the time I was reading yeah. the comics, but I went back and obviously read. And one of the best uh, interpretations, I think, of that was uh, Ultimate X-Men. Yeah. If I just want to keep talking about X-Men. He uh, he was just, he gave him kind of long hair, kind of a surfer look to him, but he was still like brilliant, but he's also just a big, like I said, thick boy. Yeah, he, he thick. <laughs> um, and it was a brilliant way of uh, when, they, when he eventually turned blue and furry in there, yeah, him and Storm were in a relationship. Yeah. And he... Just felt like he was so ugly, like she had no issues. He pushed her away, and like it was just that was a just great interpretation of like of beast transformation and how they worked in with a relationship. And I just feel that human side all just goes back to Stanley. Yeah. So, and you know what they say about guys who have feet that big? They need big shoes. Exactly. <laughs> what you got, Jerry? <laughs> Maybe fourteen wide, else. brother. <laughs> uh, so. um for mine, yeah. instead of it uh, being ingrained in the comic books and everything, uh, my uh, my first introduction to Stanley was the animated shows. For and sure. Everything. And um, like X-Men and Spider-Man in particular, because those are like my Saturday morning cartoons, um, totally recommend uh, any any of that stuff. It was all really great. Uh, they, uh, they actually, I remembered that they actually had an episode of Spider-Man that was really great, and it's not just because I love alternate universe Spider-Man, but they, so they were dealing with this threat, they had to pull all these Spider-Man from other universes, and there was one that they had that like, well, I don't have any powers and stuff, and they were, they just kind of like pushed him off to the side, they're like, okay, well you just like stay here and chill. You find out that this Spider-Man was the movie universe Spider-Man. And at the end of the episode, he kind of got with the cartoon, the animated Spider-Man was like, hey, come with me. There's somebody I want you to meet. And it didn't, he took him to, you know, the Marvel, Marvel Studios, Marvel headquarters. And he ended up meeting Stan Lee and Stan Lee got to swing around with him and everything. And it was like really interesting uh, and neat concept of uh, Stan Lee meeting like one of his, uh, his own creations, his own heroes. And, uh, I just kind of always go back to that episode whenever I, uh, think of like him and his, all of the, uh, the animated series that, that I really enjoyed and all of his, uh, all of his little cameos and the voiceover work that he did for that was just, and he's, he's done it for just about every single animated series that they've put out. He's actually even done um, some anime series. Um, there were actually two in particular. I, I can't remember if they made an anime for one, but I know he was in a manga series called Ultimo. And okay. he was, uh, I think he was like a villain in it. But then there was a, uh, there was another one uh, with a giant robot. And he was actually like a character in it that was pretty great. That's awesome. Yeah. So just, just having him like, in those, and then I think um, he uh, he even met with the uh, the people 
that we're doing the Tokusatsu uh, Spider-Man series um, to get that the ball rolling on that. And um, there's just there's just so many so many things in media that he created that I think everybody should should give a chance to and, and check out and everything. Like you know, mostly the the X Men and Spider Man animated series from from the nineties um, were were my all time favorite. I just really enjoyed them, and I th- I feel like everybody would. Yeah, for sure. Mm-hmm. I wonder if they have those in like a collective edition. I, I haven't checked in a while, but uh, I feel like they should. Yeah. Mm-hmm. If nothing else, it'll probably be out on the Disney uh, app or. I, or I hope so because they've, as far as I've known, they've never had them on Netflix. Yeah. So, and it might be a deal with like, you know, Fox and Sony having the rights to them as well. So, hmm. I have to look into that because yeah, I would, I would love to own that. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah, for sure. Well, all right. I guess it's my turn. Uh, so mine is comics. Um, probably of no surprise to any of <laughs> anyone. Um, so th- if I think about my favorite book that Stan wrote, it 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 is always the book I'm going to talk about, and that is the Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One from 1964, uh, because it rep- it it kind of solidifies everything that that was Stan Lee. Uh, it solidifies the everything that he did at Marvel that I think is amazing and that has led to the longevity of that character in that company. And I mean, just the way it's written and the way it presents itself, it's just entrenched in Stanley. It, it is, it is his, his DNA is in the ink, man. It's, it's that much of, of who he is um, from the very first page uh, that, you know, <laughs> it's jam packed with, with special surprise features. Uh <laughs> It's featuring Spidey's biggest, longest, greatest battle as he attacks the Sinister Six with a galaxy of the most gall-darned guest stars <laughs> that you can shake a web at. I mean, that's Stanley. Mm-hmm. Like that, that is Stanley. Um, from way back in, in, in 1964 when he was having to deal with things like the Comics Code Authority. So, but what makes this book so incredible and what, <coughs> what makes it uh, so special? one of my favorite issues is that it's the first time Spider-Man faces the sinister six. So it takes all of these villains that he's had to deal with, uh, from the past. I think at this point there had been, uh, maybe eight or nine issues. Um, I'm having to flip back and look, I'm not really sure, but he, it throws them all in one. It's, it's, it's swinging a baseball bat at him, man. Like he went from, or, or, you know, a sledgehammer. It's, it's Spidey having to deal with all of these, these things, you know, can Spider-Man save the two people he loves the most in the world uh, from the Deadly Sinister Six? Uh, in order to rescue Betty Brant and Aunt May, Spidey must find the way to defeat the undefeatable Sinister Six. Uh, what happens now? Just when the world needs him most, Peter Parker seems to have lost his uh, spider powers. You know, all of that. All of that. It, it's, it's almost the legacy of Spider-Man. And that's just on the cover page. <laughs> and so, yeah, no, I love, I love this book. Um, it starts off, Doc Ock has been arrested and they've taken his little, uh, leg, leggies away, um, and they put him in prison. Of course, that's not going to hold Doc Ock. He's got, he radio controls them and they sneak in, he busts out and he kind of collects all of these figures to, you know, um, I, I have to go back and read it again. I'm not really sure what the connection is, but the, basically they go and kidnap Aunt May and, and Betty. Be- oh, no, I do know what the, the connection is because they know that Peter Parker is, connected to Spider-Man and they know if, if they get Peter that they're going to get Spidey. They just don't know that he is. Um, it's, 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 I think 41 pages of just silver age awesomeness, uh, mm-hmm. drawn impeccably by Steve Ditko. Uh, this book has got some of my, another reason it's one of my favorites is because I am such a, a whore for the art. Um, it's got some of the best pinups of, the of the Sinister Six, who many of which are some of my favorite villains in Marvel um, ever. You, you get these full page uh, spreads where he's punching Electro or where he's grappling with uh, with with Craven and some cheetahs. Uh, each one of them gets their own their own page. Uh, they're they're at this phenomenal. And arguably the one I, I like the least is the one with Doc Ock because it's you don't see Doc Ock, but he's in he's in a watery cage. Uh, where he's trying to drown him like an octopus, uh, right. and that's so we we think of Doc Ock as kind of a foil to Spider Man, but I don't know that in many cases throughout history we've, we've ever 
seen him really embody like what an octopus would be like in the water. And this, this does that. Um, I think it's fantastic. Another reason that I really, really love it is because throughout the book, it brings in, and like I said, I think this is the first annual. I don't know if it's the first annual ever, but it's definitely the first Spider-Man one. I'm not sure if there's been a Fantastic Four one by this point or not. Uh, but it brings in all, almost all, of the characters from the Marvel Universe. As Spidey is swinging through Manhattan, uh, he almost gets like wiped out by Thor because Thor's in a hurry. Uh, <laughs> Thor's got places to be. And he's saying, oh, well, he didn't even see me uh, swinging by. He must be on the way to do something with the Avengers. And you can follow the adventures of the Avengers in their own book, uh, in their own monthly series. A little bit later, he and I want to say it's Flash are arguing. Um, and Flash goes to hit him because he walked home with Flash's girl because uh, that's the kind of person that Flash is. Mm-hmm. And Pete ducks. And he <laughs> Flash like goes through the astral projection of Doctor Strange, oh. <laughs> who's just kind of just walking down the street, uh, being all astrally and whatnot, mm-hmm. uh, and it <laughs> freaks him out. And it's you know it's saying, "Hey kids, watch where you're going," uh, you know. But you can read the adventures of Doctor Strange <laughs> in his own book. A uh, little bit later, uh, Iron Man pops up. Uh, the Fantastic Four uh, are doing some stuff and that are looking around, um, and you know. Spider-Man and Johnny have a great relationship. And so anytime I see those characters together, I'm just, I fall in love with well, them. Well, they are amazing friends. They, they are, uh, along with <laughs> Firestar. Along with Firestar. <laughs> uh, and you actually get to see Pete and, and Johnny fight oh, no, a little wait. bit in this. Sorry, that was Iceman. Wasn't it was Iceman. It was. I'm a bad comic book fan. Iceman, well, Firestar, and Peter, right? Yeah, yeah, it wasn't, wasn't yeah, even torch. That's Never true. Mind. Oh, I forgot. Yeah, we just failed. No, um, boy. <laughs> anyway, in in our grief, we have missed some things. <laughs> yeah, um, that, that's why we're bad at comics. <laughs> and so, but the book the book reads just like you would expect it to. But by, by the end, uh, Spidey barely escapes. His it, it plants the seed for his powers being unstable uh, because they go away and it almost kills him a little bit. Um, Mysterio pops up and it's just Mysterio. Um, it, it's really fun. It's it again. It's one of my favorite Spider-Man stories of all time, and it's certainly my favorite thing that that Stan and uh, that Stan created. Uh, and if you want to read one issue that really just nails Stanley's writing, Stanley's spirit, uh, his creativity, find a copy of the Amazing Spider-Man Annual Number One because that's the book. Like I, I, I want. I don't own this as a floppy, and and I will one day. Uh, I will pay large quantities of money <laughs> to get it because I want it. Like it's, it means that much to me. Like this is, this is the, the pillar of Stan Linus. Right. So go check it out. Unfortunately, Craig is, Hey Craig, what did you want to talk about? Who can say where the road goes? <laughs> what would, what, what, what would have been your book of the week, Craig? What Stan Lee creation would you want to talk about? Oh, it would definitely be uh, Spider-Man. Number one. Spider Man number one. Also. Or Amazing Fantasy 15. Yeah. yeah. Right on, Craig. Good, good. Get back I, to work, Craig. Get back in the hole. <laughs> I like how we just live here now. Yeah. <laughs> We're just always with Craig. Um, <laughs> Craig. Well, Craig is always with us. It, it, he does. He in, lives in our hearts. hearts. Mm-hmm. Uh, man, those are good picks all around. Like, I absolutely love that. Um, so, this is the portion of the show where normally we would get ahead of ourselves a little bit. And, and talk about some books that are coming out next week. And I think we're still going to do that, uh, right? I think I think that's yes. the way we decided. Yep. Um, but we're also going to tell you something that you can go and you can grab on your own that that is uh, that collects something of Stan Lee's. Uh, because, you know, the holidays are coming up. Maybe you want to get some some cool swag. You just need something to remember Stan by. Uh, you, you should do that. So I'm going to start with that one. And then I'll move into my my book that's going to come out on Wednesday that you should all run out to your local comic shop and pick up. So, the Stan Lee book that you should go grab or get on Amazon or find it somehow is The Amazing Spider-Man, or Omnibus, at least the first one. Because I think there's there's two Omnibi. They're Omniboo. Omnib- mm-hmm. Omniboss? I'm not sure. Omnibees. 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 So, the first one collects, I want to say, the first 20. Uh, Craig said there's three of them. Oh, there's three? Get your shit together. Uh, man, I'm just... Craig uh, can't, Craig's busy working. He has to correct you, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> Craig does not have time for your bullshit, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> I hate everyone. This is not the three man podcast I wanted. <laughs> um, anyway, it's the it's the Amazing Spider Man Omnibus. It's the first one. It collects. I want to say the first thirty issues. 
Um, Don't make Craig come back. The first five. Get it right. <laughs> it collects. Uh, it collects. It's, it should be on the back. Yeah, it collects almost all of them, uh, and it's it, in the first run as far as the the Steve Ditko stuff um, on the very bottom. I, I like how you know my book. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's the first. 38 issues of The Amazing Spider-Man, Amazing Fantasy number 15, which is where he first appeared, and Annuals 1 and 2. So you get 41 issues in one volume. I want to say it's it's all of the Steve Ditko run before he got off of it. And I think, was it Sal that took over at that point? Anyway, uh, I'm not sure. But it, it's great. And it does, in fact, contain the Annual number 1, which is the book that, I, that was my book of the week. Um, and, and if you want to see where the character started. If you want to know how this character that literally everyone knows now, like I, I would argue Spider-Man is equally as big as Batman. He's equally as big as Superman, Wonder Woman in anything. He's at, he's in the, the Mount Rushmore of comics characters. If you want to see where that character stemmed from, go get this uh, and, and you will not be disappointed. It looks great on your shelf. It, it reads great. It's still fun just because it was written in the sixties. It does not feel stale. There are some elements of course that didn't, you know, that, that don't live past the, the sixties that, that do seem a little bit dated, but it's still adventurous. It's still energetic and it's still a lot of fun. Uh, but while you're looking for that, uh, you should get to your comic shop this week and pick up Crimson Lotus. Number one from dark horse comics. Why? Because it's fucking Mike Magnolia. Ooh. That's why. Uh, it's it's Mike Magnolia and John Arcudi, uh, and drawn by Mindy Lee and Michelle Madison, or Mindy Lee, Michelle Madison. She may have four names. I don't know. <laughs> um, it's uh, it's Magnolia. So you know, it's it's right. it's set into the uh, it's set in the Hellboy universe. It focuses on a character who is Lobster Johnson's arch nemesis, and it kind of gives her some. Uh, it gives her some personality from beforehand. It it opens this this world up. Craig it has does wisdom have all to spread. The work in it. And number one, number two. I mean, number one has all the Ditko. Number two starts with all the Ramita. Okay, I thought so. I wasn't sure about that. Thank Damn you. it, Caleb. Thank you. Let the man work, Caleb. <laughs> <laughs> Back in your cell. <laughs> so you get for trying to talk about Spider Man. <laughs> I, I I don't so look. I, I concede to Craig. Right. Craig is the Spider God. Um, but yeah, anyway, so Crimson Lotus number one comes out this week. You should go pick it up, especially if you're a Hellboy fan or a Lobster Johnson fan, because it's going to give some, it's going to give Boy some the uh, claw, texture. I Justice. Hate. I'm just not going to talk about things today. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I was, just, I was egging you on. <laughs> you got this. I'm, I'm scared. scared. That was, I'm done. I'm done now. Speaking <laughs> of which, they just cast Lobster Johnson, the new Hellboy movie. I'm I so saw that. that. Yeah, that was kind of why I picked that. Yeah. Yeah. Sean. I don't want to get yelled at, Jared. No, uh, <laughs> girl. <laughs> uh, I'll follow suit with uh, first my Stanley recommendation. Uh, sadly, I only found it extremely overpriced on Amazon. Is the original X Men Run Omnibus mm-hmm. for like five hundred something dollars from a third party seller? Yes. But what I'm going to tell you is, you can usually if I've seen them in the dollar boxes before. They have reprinted the very first issue. Several times. Yeah, those true. You find it with like a silver border and stuff like that. So go out and buy the first issue, even if it's a reprint, to, re- to see where X Men, from the movie franchise to the cartoons to everything that you've ever seen, their beginnings. Go out and find it one way or another. You can find it reprinted. Or if you're a multi millionaire, go buy the original book, mm-hmm. put on your gloves, go into your airproof seal container, and then read it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, if you can find an omnibus or any of the collected volumes of the early X Men, you should definitely check those. Uh, also, just throw that out there if uh, you want to read it and not spend a lot of money, um, I want to say that Marvel's streaming no, service. No, stop. Okay, backing up. Whoop, whoop. Stop. Well, you said the streaming oh. service. No, no, I'm, gonna, I'm not. Okay. I'm not going to get okay. yelled at again. Thank you. What's your book for oh, next week? Uh, he was about to run into my territory of the oh, only thing that I had. Oh, okay. <laughs> you yeah. already did yours. Yeah, uh, shut up, Caleb. <laughs> just going to sit here. Fuck's sake! You just shut up and you go pick up X Men, <laughs> Uncanny X Men Volume Two. I'm the worst. Comes out this week. <laughs> I don't know uh, what the fuck I'm doing here. <laughs> <laughs> we love you. Uncanny X Men started back up. Just They're doing a small. ten part. Like, shut up, Caleb. <laughs> They're doing a 10 part weekly, uh, for the first 10 issues. Yeah. Yeah. They're, they're putting out an issue a week. They had a very big first introductory issue, which I'll be honest. Um, it was fine. It was a hellified setup issue. And so I'm really, I'm actually looking forward to part two because I want to see where it's going to finally jump off and start going. 
Mm-hmm. That's that's the way I felt about it. Yeah, that's what I'm hoping anyway. Otherwise, I'm gonna be very sad. I'm still not gonna be reading the next mm-hmm. book. I'm, I'm gonna be he reading, doesn't pick up. I'm gonna be reading you guys' issues or just listening to you talk. Pretty much, yeah. but I mean, it was an interesting setup. But it was like I said, it was a lot of setup for the first one, and a lot of stuff I don't quite understand, which is the intent. I'm just, is what I put it out weekly. I'm sure it's gonna be a very fast paced storytelling. Yeah. So I'm hoping volume two or issue two is gonna be uh, picking up on that. So that's what I'm looking forward to this coming week. So Caleb. <laughs> Uh, am, as, I, am I allowed to say words, or do I need to go as, sit in a fucking shut mouth? your whore mouth, Caleb? As, as Caleb was saying, um, Marvel Marvel has an app called Marvel Unlimited. Um, in honor of um, everything that Stan Lee did, uh, they actually have a bunch of free issues that Stan Lee had worked on. And you could just go on and you could read these single issues. There's Amazing Fantasy 15. Uh, the first issues of Captain America, Fantastic Four, The Incredible Hulk. They've got his uh, Silver Surfer that he worked on with Mobius. Uh, they even have the Stanley Presents uh, Spider-Man, where mm-hmm. he's actually in the comic. Um, they just have a lot of goodness in there, uh, X-Men. Um, and I actually started reading some of them uh, the other evening. So that's that would be my my thing that I would say. Go on to you know Marvel Unlimited and check out some of the works that Stanley did without having to really pay for them. And then I think they even have like older issues that you can purchase for not, not a whole lot. Yeah. Well, if, so on the, the way the app works, you pay a monthly fee. It's like, it's kind of like Netflix, but mm-hmm. you get everything. You get the entire Marvel mm-hmm. catalog back to those issues mm-hmm. um, for it, like they, they have a six month buffer. Mm-hmm. Um, so anything that hasn't been written the six months is on there for right. 10 bucks. You get everything, like everything Marvel mm-hmm. and which includes a lot of the stuff. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's all I was going to say. And, and without having a s- subscription, you can actually read just those first issues. Right. And everything. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then my, my book for next week to uh, no one's surprise is going to be web of venom. Uh, was it carnage born number one? Um, it's, uh, yeah, Carnage Born. And if you read, uh, Venom this week, then, uh, you might see where it's going. It's, uh, Donnie Kay, it's Danilo Beirut and, uh, Kyle Holtz. Um, join Donnie Cates as he continues to snake his tendrils through the Venom mythos, this time visiting the sickening sociopath called Carnage, a cruel cannibal obsessed with death and murder. Few mourn Cletus Cassidy after he seemingly died and venomized. But now a cult devoted to the madman has gathered, hoping to resurrect their fallen idol and return his madness to the Marvel Universe. And uh, with how the last issue of Venom ended, uh, spoiler, 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 um, I'm pretty excited about this issue. I I think it's just going to be a one shot. uh, But I mean, Donnie Case is is working on it and he is doing some amazing work on Venom right now. That's what I hear. Yes. Well, guys, are we ready to bring this thing home? Sure. Yes, sir. I don't want to get yelled at. <laughs> Let's a, bring it home. I'll allow it. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you have enjoyed what you have heard, and we really hope that you have, uh, come check us out on social media, guys. We're on Facebook. Uh, we have a great group, uh, or we have a great page, not a group, I should say. And it's you know, we're posting news. We're talking about things. We're having great conversations. And you can come interact and be a part of the Southern Fried family. Join our little community. Uh, we have a great time there. We think you will, too. We're also always posting stuff on Instagram and on Twitter. We're at SFG Podcast on both of those. If you have questions, comments, or concerns, you can feel free to drop us an email at southernfriedgeekery at gmail.com. Um, other than that, you can find us again where you found us because this is you're listening to us. <laughs> you right have now. found us. Congratulations! Uh, <laughs> you succeeded. <win. laughs> you succeeded. Um, we we hope you really did enjoy this episode. Um, we we hated doing it, but we also weren't going to not do it. Um, Stanley, we we didn't we didn't hate doing it. We we hated that we had to do exactly. It. Right. Um, I mean, and it was really more of a celebration of his life than yeah. a mourning of his passing. Exactly. And that's what we hope we hope we conveyed. Um, if, if you have a hero that's still alive, uh, find a way to let them know. Uh, you know, we have social media. We have email. Uh, you write them a letter. Just do something. Just But, you know, be nice. Uh, you, you're, you're not guaranteed these people forever. So enjoy them while you have them. And don't be a dick on the Internet. Um, other than that, go forth and love some comments. Excelsior! <laughs> <laughs>